not a quiz. I thought, it's just, I thought, I thought the first question that it happened on stream twice, like even in an in-house. Like I don't. It's my ass, right? All these. Fo I think we can discredit Bryce and Froden. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Don't Talk If You Don't Know. It's our 50th episode special. Uh, that was a really fancy intro video done by Bryce, an editor that he had. Who's the, who's the person that did our intro, Bryce? Yeah, Gu Gundam uh, Astria. It was a, it's a referral that Gangly gave, uh, oh. gave me. And by the way, this person is incredible. And if anyone ever needs video editing work in connection with TFT, I highly recommend them. They were like great to work with. We've got a bunch of video packages they did throughout the show, actually. Fantastic. Well, thank you to them as uh, this is our 50th 5-0 episode. Can you believe it, Bryce? Uh, what a journey it's been uh, to get to this point. It's wild because we started in set six and we had like kind of high hopes to start off the podcast. And then it kind of evolved over time to what it is now, which is it's a little bit more than just a podcast. It's sort of like a brand that represents competitive TFT in North America. It started branching out. Uh, and so normally this week, today is July 2nd, 2024. Normally this week, we're supposed to do a regionals preview. We're supposed to say, hey, you know, we're going into Golden Spatula. That's what it's called now. Uh, we're going to do like all this hype, power rankings, fantasy draft predictions, so on and so forth. But... You know, I think it's very appropriate that we stopped here at episode 50 and do a special with just me and you, no guests, and just kind of reflect about some of the best memories because we're, we're constantly looking forward and maybe just right behind us. But, you know, I think with TFT having kind of like no off season, so to speak, it's so easy just to yeah. kind of forget what immediately happened and move on. That's why so many players, I think, are bad at remembering even past metas and, yeah. and other sets. So having this moment to reflect, I think, is really huge for us. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like as you know, I've been really excited about this episode for a long time. I've been really looking forward to it. It's a we spend so much time in our lives, like doing TFT, thinking about TFT, talking about TFT, but we really don't spend that much time reflecting on like the experience of TFT. It's been a huge part of both of our lives since the game came out, uh, and so like taking a quick beat to take stock, stock just felt appropriate, uh, and I hope. I hope we're around for a hundredth episode. I hope we get to do this again, but maybe not. Maybe this will be, you know, who knows how life's going to uh, play out. All right. All right. So let's start off with maybe just the very beginning. I think we're, we're, the focus of most of this episode is going to be from the start of the podcast, which is uh, set six, uh, 2021. Uh, yeah, 2021. And we're going to be analyzing through the lens of that. We're going to do really fun stuff throughout the day. We're going to have uh, a, a top 50 historical rankings. We're going to evaluate our fantasy drafts. We're going to look at players' historical tournament performances. Uh, we're going to look at me versus Bryce in tournament. Who's actually done better? We're going to... And, I, and in fantasy draft, we're going to answer once and for all which <laughs> caster is the better drafter. Um, we have some more highlight videos. It's like a couple of minutes long each, so it's going to be a lot of like look uh, looking back in that. But first, before we do that, I kind of want us to just remember what was it like when TFD first came out, the very beginning for us. So Bryce, what was your memory... When TFT first launched back in 2019. Uh, so my my like origin in TFT is kind of a wild story, actually. And you're like a fairly meaningful part of it. But it was it was in really quick succession. I The game had come out. I had a bunch of friends that were playing and tell me that I was going to love it. But I hadn't made the jump yet and tried. And then I was in Vegas for the World Series of Poker. And you were competing out. in World Series of Poker? Yeah, well, so yeah, I was playing, I remember I played the main that year, that would have been, yeah, 2000, yeah, yeah, um, so I was down there with a bunch of LA poker people who are also esports people, and there's actually quite a bit of overlap between the poker world and the esports world, so anyone here is a poker fan, my first game of TFT was, like, with Scott Seaver and Justin Bonomo and a bunch of other poker people, Damn. uh, Seaver's popping off right now, by the way, he's already won three World Series of Poker bracelets this year, what a beast, um, uh, anyway, so Main I played with drama. them and I was hooked. So the next day after after the tournament ended, we went back to the land cafe in one of the Vegas casinos. I don't remember which one had it and just played TFT for like six or seven hours and then went to sleep and woke up the next day and played more poker. Um, and so I came back from Vegas. I was hooked. I played a shitload. And then the Twitch Rivals thing happened. It was, it was probably like, I don't know how long. How long, Do you remember how long after this would have been? Like probably like three or four weeks. Like when I, I actually one have the these tweets pulled up. I'm glad you asked. So... Back in September that. 23rd, 2019, Frodian tweeted, 
back when he worked at Twitch Rivals, I used to okay. run the Twitch Rivals program and we had TFT as part of it for TwitchCon. I said, uh, PSA for TFT streamers, we still have spots open for the 75,000 TFT open at TwitchCon. If you're interested, please DM me or visit this website. And when Bryce, at the time, we were just, uh, Bryce like mm-hmm. responded. He says, is there still space? <laughs> this is back when me and Bryce weren't even really like friends. We were like a, a mutual yep. acquaintances at we, that point. We hadn't even we hadn't even met yet, right? Because this no, was before no, no, no. you were, but you were dating Taylor at this point. Yes, yes, and she yeah. introduced us, which she's both always yeah. very uh, reticent to remind me. She's like, rem- I just want you to remember, I was Jesus Bryce's credit. friend first. <laughs> she gets credit for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, and then Bryce ended up signing up, and he then started posting about it just a couple days later. Like it's official. I'm playing in the Twitch Rivals TFT tournament at TwitchCon Saturday. Time to prove prove that lawyers don't suck at games. I feel the weight <laughs> of the entire scorn profession on my shoulders. <laughs> I forgot I tweeted that. <laughs> and how'd you do at TwitchCon? Well, very well. I like very well. I so there was there I think there were eight people who went through the open bracket, which is what you gave me a spot into. It was like a two hundred person open bracket or something. I don't remember what the numbers were. It could have been a hundred, it could have been three hundred. I don't fucking know. Large open brackets. And I think I was one of eight people who made the main. So most of the main was like Milk and Soju and, uh, you know, just right who wound up winning the tournament and a bunch of like Hafu, Dog, Scar, etc. So anyway, so I actually qualified. Me and Kibler, me and Brian Kibler were the two people in our like second or third round lobby in the open qualifier that then qualified into the main. And I actually did well in the main too. Like after two games, I think I was in like tied for eighth place or something. And then... I, if anyone remembers set one, there was a uh, Imperial comp that you had to, you had to hit a Swain. This is back before they realized that like the opening up a vertical by giving you one five cost that you randomly lottery into isn't the best. But at the time, if I had hit one Swain on my level eight roll down, I think I actually would have like made the top eight of Twitch rivals, but I didn't. I like full sent a fast day with like 60 gold and, uh, and never hit a Swain and I fucking went out. I forgot. Google. Taylor actually has a picture of you and Kilo- Taylor. Do you actually have that picture? If she can hear me, of uh, Bryce, just send it to me, and then I can actually show it because it was really endearing. It. Yeah, it was really endearing. Send it, send it to me too, Tate, because I don't know that I have that picture. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Um... So, and, and this event, by the way, TwitchCon was when I first started getting yeah. more interested in TFT because prior to that, my experience with TFT was that I was kind of in this middle of the phase where I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do with Hearthstone. Um, I wanted to specifically, well. If people already had figured out by then was that I was losing interest in the game, largely due to yep. what Activision Blizzard was doing with the product, not because the game itself was anything bad. Yep. But um, I was kind of in this like phase where I was confused. And I liked TFT, but I had to drop it because I was doing Hearthstone Grandmasters full-time. And I wasn't actually able to focus on it because I wanted to like pl- uh, focus on Hearthstone immediately. Mm-hmm. But then I watched TFT 1 be played at TwitchCon, and I realized that the game mode had immense amount of depth. Like, I watched Sleet and Jay Shrip yep. go, like, 1-1-2-1 one, one, one trading uh, first and seconds. And Soju and Solos and Milk were doing well at TwitchCon as well, but, like, I was just specifically watching these two players. Oh, Milk actually, it. that's all true except for Milk. Milk flamed the fuck out of TwitchCon. I outplaced Milk at TwitchCon. Oh! <laughs> Why does my memory say that he did well? I think Soju did well at TwitchCon. So it was, like, Milk's first time away from home, and he was super nervous. Yeah, Soju top. Soju went third, I think. Yeah, but yeah, Milk yeah, went, yeah. like, okay, Milk yeah, went, yeah. like, dead fucking last year. he was in all of my lobbies and i was super intimidated going in and then he was horrible. oh man that's so funny um but uh i remember uh watching these and like wow tft is actually a game where like there's some meaningful amount of skill expression mm-hmm. and i was like blown away by it because the trait like Slee was like doing transitions really thoughtful things and just like things i never th- thought was uh really yeah. possible uh so it blew my mind the second was and i say this lovingly the casting was awful it was just so bad it was done by it was done by kobe and mark z yeah and they were there because they were they were supposed to do league of legends but because they also played uh, tft on the side it was a new game mode yeah they decided to just like throw them on it as well and again they're fantastic talent but you know they, they they did not do tft justice and i remember because tft has so much viewership the executive producer of twitch rivals came over to me he's like i thought this was like the new hype game like What's going on, man? Like, there's just it's like there's not a lot of energy in the cast. The crowd isn't really responding to it mm-hmm. because they were there to watch Toast and Hafu and all of them. Yep. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. So like, I got fired up. And then after that, set two came out, and then I started to get into set two, and that's when I started texting Bryce, and I started my very first cast ever with Doa uh, back in yep. set two. I remember. Yeah. And, and uh, do you remember? 
Go ahead. When did we start playing? When did we start playing together? Was it set two or set three? Uh, we first started playing in set three uh, because okay. that's when I started. Because I was hard stuck mass a uh, diamond. I was hard stuck diamond. He said to do in, in set two. I w- I couldn't actually even get to masters. <laughs> Uh, to be fair, I was splitting game attention, so like I wasn't exactly yeah, yeah. focused on TFT. But I remember I spammed Ocean Mages like all the time yep. because I remember seeing Solus uh, reply to More Dog about Ocean Mages every day, and I so like I was like, "Oh, this Solus guy didn't he make that Demons comp? Uh, I'm gonna j- j- just spam <laughs> Ocean Mages." And I couldn't get Masters. I played like 300 games and I was stuck D1. Um, but that was that, that that was my origin story in TFT. Back I missed the good old days because it, it was starting when Dan and I started playing together. We played like a lot of games together. Like most days, we would be in Discord. One of us would be playing. Some of us would be VOD reviewing or whatever. But like most days, we're just kind of vibing <laughs> playing. Uh, not the most efficient way to climb, but it was really fun. Uh, I but I really missed the days when you were like much worse than me at TFT. It was kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh, I can teach Dan some things. Yeah, like Dan was yeah. teaching. Basically, I taught Dan some tft and then he taught me how to cast but then you know really quickly he caught up to me in playing but i never caught up to him in casting that's not so true. here that's we, so true. here we are today that's not true at all i mean i think you've improved leaps and uh, your your oh, growth I... relative to me has actually been way higher but you started that's at a like, lower baseline so I that's like yeah 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 lower baseline <laughs> it's like fucking you know lebron james versus like the dude struggling to make jv uh... high school basketball but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. lower baseline <laughs> good times good times uh so fast forward a few sets where bryce and i started casting and figuring things out mm-hmm. One and then eventually something kind of interesting happened, which is I moved to Seattle and I started hanging out with Bryce and we had this great idea of what if we gathered the top players in North America and started doing our own rankings in TFT because the reality is it was like we had so many debates of who were the best players in set four and five, right? Like was, uh, w- w- you know, where was players like Ram Kevin set four after his world's run? But he was yep. legitimately one of the best players in set four, but like that goes unnoticed. In set five, there was like people like Bertosaurus and uh, uh, and Ramblin who were starting to get better. There was legitimately no way to quantify because everyone just keeps talking about the same players at the time, which was Soju and Milk and um, or, um... Kurum. All these other people back in the day. New Bow was the time was at the peak of conversation. Yeah, everyone fucking loved New Bow. Socks, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So this was our original panel. I have it pulled up. We was like, okay, let's so we'll, let's, let's 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 take inspiration from Smash Bros. Peer review. And have an end of set review. And from there, that's the definitive number one. Whoever finishes rank one there or we get ballots for power rankings, you get a good trend of how players are doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's funny because there's only four people that remain from this ballot. And that's me, you, Gangly, and Soju. Soju's actually been with us the entire time. Can I just say one real homie move Soju to like lend his brand to this right away and to stick with it throughout the whole thing. Do the do the podcast come on the pod you know do the rankings come on the podcast a bunch he's been a huge supporter of the show and we literally took the name from him too and he was he was yeah, just like true. we took one of his isms we yeah. literally took it's fucking <laughs> his thing he's like whatever i come up with a new ism like every other day it's fine yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but then some self glaze for a second dan when we when we picked this out gangly as the last person who's been in the, since the beginning what a great fucking choice that was we knew we wanted someone with like a different perspective nick has always been the like carrier of the stats torch in tft since yeah. way back then More and stuff. continues uh yeah and and continues to to this day he's been an awesome panelist uh um, yeah, and, and even guest host the show while you were out on pat leaf that's true that's true i'm really thankful for that and uh i, I want i want gangly gangly wants so badly to be on the show for a fantasy draft we have to do that we have to yeah. get him on that yeah, if if you can't make it, Bryce, maybe I'll have him <laughs> on one episode, maybe. Because uh, I like it, it. I like it. You're gonna have to re- you have to wrestle this control from the steering wheel from my cold dead hands. <laughs> I love it. That seems very reasonable to me. I've done it once. I'm I'm down to be done. <laughs> Sounds good. So we launched this in 2021. As you can see in the timestamp of the tweet with that panelist announcing the launch of a new TFT project. Uh, don't talk if you don't know. And then this was our first ever rankings. Our first ever yeah. rankings. It's like looks completely different. Our power rankings now look uh wildly different in terms of it first of all the, the legibility of this we i remember we looked at this graphic and was like this is this doesn't look that good but um we gra- we drastically improved it and look at where we sat back then so it's just fun to look back at ramblin was number one this was in and set do you six. know because this is before we realized you need to do average points per ballot to give context because like i don't know were there 50 were there 10 ballots and and he got it exactly he got unanimous or were there like 
11 or 12 ballots and he's not even because it just happens to be around 150. Right, right, exactly. Um, I'm pulling up a comparison of our uh, most recent uh, power, right, just to show you the evolution of it. But uh, it's it's funny because yeah. Ramblin' number one, Setsuka number two, Goose. Goose number three, which I, yeah. you know, a fun story about that. I told you how I first started casting a set two with Doa. Mm-hmm. It was a Fandom Legends community cup. And that was the first time Grand Vice 8, that was on a different username at the time, mm-hmm. was playing. Is playing like open flex TFT. That's what set two is renowned yep. for amongst pro circles. Hyper yep. flexible, hyper skill expressive. Yes, a lot of bullshit and randomness happened, but a lot of yes. players finally remember it. And GV, I remember Bryce texting me after watching GV play yes. like a flex, like, um line i forgot exactly what it was um, and bryce was like this is the golden age of tft this is such good tft play and i was like literally on cash texting it back like dude this was so sick it was so it was better than anything that had happened to date gv8 i think that there were some core weaknesses to his game but there's a lot about what he did in tft that was like super innovative and special especially for the time uh, and it was just, yeah, it was like, I I was already in love with TFT at that point, but that was when I was like, oh man, this game can be taken to a whole different level. And yeah. that's, and basically ever since that's been my whole pursuit is just like thinking about th- that level of TFT. That's what makes it, that's what makes it fun and special to me. L- looking at some of these names who've been here for a while, like Spencer's still really at the top. And this was fresh off his world's run. Robin just had made world. Remember is one, one, yep. one, five, one, which is ridiculous. High roll. Yep. Uh, and still never been replicated based off the yeah, still, still the record at regionals that we knew it at the time. We were like, yeah. this may never happen. Never again. again. This is, <laughs> this is gonna okay. be really hard to beat. So not to not to to uh, to to be casting shade, but I remember I was getting re- me we were you getting really excited about this. And there were some people who were like, Why are you getting so excited? First of all, it's like TFT, it's like a calm game. But I was like, mm-hmm. this is literally something that we'll never see again. Yeah. It be- also because of the point system. It was like first for 10 points for first. So like no one could literally ever break Robin because we're not going back to the 10 point scoring system. Yeah. But uh, it was incredibly hype. Uh, and I, and I, and you know, Robin hasn't been back to worlds, but I mean, he made himself a career. He made himself a TFT career just from that tournament. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh, well, and yeah. And, and his incredible longevity and consistency since then, like, yeah. well, I don't, you know, we're going to get into that over the course of the show a little bit, but mm. yeah, Robin, he has impressively a lot of these names have fluctuated a lot over the, if you look at this list non-tom like, oh, dude non-tom at number six dude what what happened to that guy uh yeah i mean uh, the last time i remember non-tom he was beefing with press event uh and i don't really know what to say i mean my if you go back and check the receipts on the show every time non-tom comes up i basically just kind of flame the guy and i'm like i don't i don't know why people think this guy's good i've watched him play like a lot i don't think he's very good man <laughs> and i don't know why oh. you all rank him highly and he and by the way fucking scoreboard on that one all the people who told me non-tom was fucking good because <laughs> he fucking never proved that shit he, he was right. It's because he did well on ladder. He did well on ladder. Sure, but that's fine. But like he streamed it, so we got to watch the play, and like it was he never deeply passed your flaws. He never passed your yeah. Eyes. Okay, so <laughs> from, from what I've come to understand, non Tom quit TFT kind of a little bit like Bebe, which is like you know kind of went through like it's not worth it, except with a little bit less flair, and then uh, and then went to go get a regular job, started competing again for fun, but like there's like some infam- infamous moments where he like didn't have tournament realm downloaded and like was really slow about it and like as a result got dq'd and then yeah. uh like w- officially quit tft right afterwards uh classic tft hey, hey player never forget the dr- the press of drama on the way out the door one of my favorite tft dramas uh what so what exactly happened with that i don't re- it was something on twitter i don't remember i think I, if memory serves non-tom like non-tom decided to talk shit to someone and then press event kind of clapped back and it was pretty good can someone remind us in chat? I think Someone's it was like Preston called him. Let me let me see. I think Preston called himself like the Demon One of TFT. Yeah. Okay. So Preston on July seventh, two thousand twenty three, tweets the Demon One of TFT, and he got himself. This is, I think this might have been the first time Preston got rank one. And he's okay. he's rank one over Dish Soap. He's re- he's rank one over Setsuko, who called himself respectful, humble, and then uh, I think. Don Tom got offended that he called himself yep. the demon one of TFT. And so he started flaming him because of that. Oh, oh I remember. Okay, so, okay, I have, I have a tweet from him. Can I actually pull this? Give me a sec. Yeah, it, 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 the chat's got us with the main tweet. The Can I, can I do, do you want to do the dramatic reading of the non Tom? Yeah, 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 give me a sec here. I, I yeah. got it right here. So I'm pulling out, this is live uh, production. Live production okay. for the special 50th episode. So uh, I got it right here. I'm just going to slap it on top. <clears throat> Milk. 
woke up and new TFT players beefing for the first time. This community has been too wholesome and Riot likes games with more drama like Valorant and LOL. Context, Preston hit rank one and called himself the demon of TFT and non-top, a former rank one player isn't too happy about it. Non-top. Do you have the same respect for a person to hit rank one all the time, stay on top five ladder mostly while having a full-time job? Or the guy hard stuck low elo challenger uh, almost his entire life <laughs> hit rank one for like a day, smiley face, and on a luck patch, then call himself demon number one. And then Kiyun, just add him, bro, at precedent. And then Kevin, precedent, this guy's smoking dick or something. <laughs> we won't. I don't remember that part at all. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, we should have, you know, it would have been good if we had done the top TFT dramas of all time as part of this. Oh, and, you know, dude. Uh, okay, a, we had to do that segment. for episode 100 or something like that. Yeah, episode 100. We'll, we'll, do, do, the we'll top, do the best. We'll do the top drama. 10. We'll rank the top 10 dramas of all time. So everyone stay tuned for that. Well, it's funny because if I extend this to the right, look at my reply under it, which was uh, beefing for the first time. And I wrote Bebe's, uh, are, am I a joke to you to milk? Because at the time, Milk was beefing with Bebe a lot. See, uh, that yeah. for me is probably number one of all time, <laughs> at least to date. Something might be able to top it, but I'm not sure anything will be able to top oh. Milk versus Bebe. That's that's for me clear front runner in, in my power ranking. Oh much you. my god, that's too funny, man. That's too funny. I mean, Milk's gonna be in a bunch of them too because there's probably a couple <laughs> of good more dog Milk beefs. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, like, are for sure gonna be up there. I'm pretty sure uh, Milk is going to box most of the TFT community the first time we ever have our boxing match, and then Suzuki mm. will take on all of Brazil. That's kind of the, the latest. Oh, okay. uh... <laughs> We're sending our best boxers, for sure. Yep, yep. So that's some of the origins of the podcast, um, and you know that's, that's how we got started with our power rankings. As you guys see on the far right side, this is currently where our power rankings is. It's a lot fancier. We're having things uh, in-house, but it's a lot more sophisticated. Uh, but we decided to also take a step back, Bryce, and we want to reflect on the rankings as a whole. So we decided to start a top 50 historical North American rankings, uh, which we're going to do. But before we do that, we want to show you guys uh, some of our favorite moments from the podcast uh, from the first 50 episodes. So check it out. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Big boy, boy, oh, oh, just, 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 just listen, just listen. <laughs> now listen. The, the, the commentary is great. Still not Wait, rolling? It's not rolling. I'm so happy. Yeah. Yeah. Have you? I got the production. Dude, roll! Yeah, sorry about that. I, uh, too loud. No, it's great. Holy <laughs> shit. Oh, wait. Blitz 3. He's, wait. Oh, he just hit Blitz 3. Not the f. Oh, he missed Blitz 3. He missed Blitz 3. He has 6 2. Oh, wait. Yo, we are so glad Kerm is here for this. Oh, <laughs> wait, he's so close. Oh, he's <laughs> he died with 11 gold. I'm a f Andrew Haywasher. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, my God. So let's go ahead and uh, and bring it back up. So, Kane Drew, what the hell happened, man? Believe it or not, I actually am looking for Blitz Crank. But, like, you're rolling down, you have your Chosen, you just kind of, like, ignore that Chosen slot. I, I roll past it, and I immediately see it, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, there goes my Blitz Crank 3. To be fair, nobody else in the call other than Kurum saw it, so, like, I feel like it's kind of understandable. Taco Bell Wi-Fi. Playing Lee Sin every game, and then once Lee Sin got nerfed, he lost like a thousand oh, LP in like man. two days. Rain plosion. She uses the most annoying no. little. Oh. Any thoughts on Kevin? He did oh, like this 15 guy, of these. I feel like he yeah, greased yeah. my first carousel item like every single game. He just full opens every game, and then he greased my spat for no reason. Wait, hold on. Actually, I have an entry on this guy in my list. <laughs> Takes spat <laughs> instead of stunfire with belt glove to grief me, and he sits on spat the entire game on bench on like for like three stages, and then just doesn't make anything the whole game. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Wait, are you allowed, like allowed to be really toxic? Like really, really sure. toxic? Fire away. Okay, well my entry in my list for clear is Big Eagle always hard forces one comp, AK Varus, and hard for seven sets. <laughs> uh, Stellar Minhi. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no idea who this guy is. No offense. I have, I have a lot of words for this guy. Okay, this guy, he just types every single game. The moment anything goes wrong, he's like, oh, why, why did I lose this fight? My Shivana's trolling. Like... <laughs> we don't care. Just keep it to yourself. Like this guy is just so annoying. Types every game. Why is like half the half the letters capitalized and half of it is just lowercase? Like it's so weird. Oh whatever. All these f***ers need this tournament for their precious little qualifier point. Oh, I need this little qualifier point, or I'm not going to make it to mid sets or regionals. Ooh. 
But me, I'm a fucking beast, man. I qualify through less. Well, most we try high to skill, all of your high sample size, from every most skill testing oh environment. I'm going to regionals through letter. <laughs> the tournament, I'm out. Peace. Oh, <laughs> <clears throat> this one's a big one. Saying TFT is competitive is a lie. And since we have different people showing up in each world, TFT competitive will never be branded and accumulate viewers. People watch competition to see the most charismatic slash talented slash disciplined or favorite individuals to battle it out. But since the game and format is way too RNG based, it's going to keep getting different people on the scene and it's never going to grow significantly like Valorant or LOL. So this L. <laughs> Re replay belong mm. in the same tier as Setsuko, oh, Gary Soap, oh, and the, ya the Yap. Specifically, let's talk about this tier. We're talking way, about the elite the of the elite, the creme de la creme. Bryce, the stage is set for you. Okay, so backstory is important because I'm. This is going to be the longest I've ever talked on the show. I'm apologizing in advance. Oh I've had God. for a long times. No, no, sir, sit back. <laughs> and you let me pour yourself out for like twelve minutes or something. It's like really long. <laughs> One hour ning tail. Yeah, they brought the gun. Uh. First thing, what else? Which would also suggest tier one. This is the four. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay so, so, uh, so please, I, agree or disagree? <laughs> no, I'm not done. I'm not done. I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, oh, sorry, sorry. So, no, no, you're not. Uh, we, so we that's just, I was like, that's just through. the stats. <laughs> oh, now, no, we now the odds. Oh, so now the eye, so now the eye test. Okay, I watched oh, all of these test. games. Okay. okay, okay. okay. Where I wind up on this question to decide whether or not I agree or I disagree, for me right now, he is barely out of the same tier as them. I think that his skill ceiling as a player when he is locked in is as high as Setsuko's and higher than Weijin's or Dish Soaps right now. Because I don't think he's giving you your, his A game as often as these guys are, but I think that his A game stands up to there's no questions asked. Okay, that's it. Solid out of wall. The high I. <laughs> All right. Well, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed some of that. Sorry about the rough transition. I mistimed it, but uh, those are some of our favorite moments from the podcast. Let's go ahead and head over to our historical rankings. Now, it's not the top 15. I didn't change the graphic for it. It's our top 50. Uh, so, Bryce, let's get some context to how we're actually going to be doing this uh, actual um, the rankings this year. Okay. So, we decided to do the rankings of the top 50 North American players, so not any of the new America's players, just historic NA. And we did it based on the era of the podcast, which just happens to be set six is when we started. And the reason why we like that is, is in a lot of ways, set six, Dawn of Augments is the kind of beginning of modern era of TFT. A lot has changed about the game. And so it felt like an okay kind of snapshot to be looking at. But obviously, if you do this list, like going all the way back to set one, you probably have very different answers to some of this. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it's it, because the early days of TFT was also quite illegitimate, like, no one's going to say set three regionals for North America was by any means an optimal format. If you guys don't remember, NA combined with OCE back in set three. It was NA OCE was the regional qualifier, and we only had two slots, and one of them was taken by Obo. Obo. Oh, so, Obo, man. And, 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 yeah, so there's like a, there's a lot of controversy with how things happened back in set three. Didn't you go like dead last at Worlds too? Yeah, basically, I mean, yeah, but like... It's not like Sox did anything better. He just one-trick bang yeah, the whole time. Fair, fair. Yeah, uh, fair. And then set four was our first real crack at it, mm -hmm. but uh, Foreman hasn't been optimized. Set five, you could argue set five was the first time Worlds was actually like kind of in a good, like, like could be legitimized. So I there's a little bit of bias from my voting where I, I kind of slightly included some set five results, but you guys will see. Um, so what we decided to do with Bryce, with my, my what we decided to do with Bryce and myself is that we divided into tiers we have a the tier four tier three tier two and tier one and within those tiers are players that you could argue could be anywhere at the very top to the very bottom but we feel like bucketing these players makes sense and we tried our best to sort them as as accurately as we could but obviously i think some people are going to disagree before you do the honorable mentions can i give one honorable honorable mention 
Uh, we don't actually have a list of honorable mentions, so go ahead. Oh, okay, great. So then the only honorable mention is going to go to Showtime, who I haven't seen in a TFT chat in like 100,000 years. <laughs> and out of nowhere, when we're doing our historic top 50, this man shows up and goes, realistically, can we agree I deserve a spot in the top 50, <laughs> even though I'm not going to be on there? I just... I am so happy that Showtime's brand is so strong as to as to give basically a bat signal for this moment. I like that was it. amazing. I like it. Uh, I will give a shout out to a few people that were on the honorable mentions list, but I feel like if we make an honorable list, mentions list officially, then we're just extending the top 50. Yep, um, sure. um, so I, I do want to say that we have Voicen at 51 and we have Non-Tom at 52 and we had New Bow at 53. None of these guys made it, which is... um. Mm-hmm. It parted because a lot of them stopped after set six, and it's just like, how can you actually include them? Even though they were their peaks were pretty good, but uh, no, they haven't really achieved anything since then. And it's hard yeah. because I think we're going to give them more recency bias because TFT's only gotten more competitive and harder. For sure, yeah. I mean, there's obviously we're ranking over over like set six and on. So some of these folks, people like New Bowl and Non Tom, for that matter, both of their best performances were earlier. Phil yep. maintained some, and like you know, Phil was at the summit, and he's had some good some good tournament moments for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's crazy that, that with how highly everyone thought of New Bowl, just never really panned out. He was just one of those names that was always like the promise of him was there, but it never it never panned out in tournaments. Yeah. It's, it's so again. There's gonna be people who disagree based off the like the eye test. You're gonna be like, hey, I think New Bowl is better than a lot of these players on this list. But we're gonna go off results, and again, it has to kind of matter from set six onwards. So just keep that in mind. So without further ado, let's go ahead and drum roll into tier four. We call it the high notes. People who had a set or two that were really good, and they've all kind of made regionals once. There is a criteria we did say that if you've never made regionals. You can't be on this list. It doesn't even make sense because uh, there's too many good players. So starting at the very bottom, Eniko barely squeezes in by our criteria because he actually did continue to play on beyond set six and had his moments uh, where he did well in cups and uh, put on some pretty respectable performances outside of it. And I think it kind of makes sense to start the list here because I think Eniko was a good floor to measure uh, of the, the, a lot of the players who did better than him because he was always right there in the cusp of like one of NA's best if he had it on. And then he kind of like bowed out somewhere around set eight where after Summit, he left for Riot. Yeah, and uh, I think this is also a little bit of a nod to Iniko in that he, this, this man like didn't just like quit to go do a job. Like a lot of people have stopped playing TFT for a job, but he like quit to go make TFT better for us, which is a total homie move. Uh, and he stopped competing as a result, but like he would be much higher on this list if he had not taken a job that stopped him from competing and it just kept playing on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he, I think he belongs in the top fifty personally. Okay, and then we have a lot of people who kind of had like the one off shoot. We had like Philip, Beery, Beery, DK, Jack, and it, and and I want to point out one thing about this uh, this band of players that a lot of them got into qualifier points. Uh, or like, like, yet yeah, yes, some of them may have uh, done well in cups as well, but. Qualifier points is different than saying I'm top four in a cup and I automatically qualify for regionals. You prove yourself over a, a, a length of a season. And then some, for, for some people, it's like more recent. And for some other people, it was like a really good season. And that also applies to people like Cam that set 11, Vanilla from set 9, Kanju in set 10. Uh, Phoenix, surprisingly, he's only made one regionals, but he had a pretty good set uh, of competitions as well. But there's, a, there's two names here at the top with Connor and Clear. Are we being too disrespectful to them? Connor made a world championship, Bryce, and Clear has made it to two regionals. I mean, okay, so let the record reflect that Dan wanted Connor. To, there's a tier, the, this is the lowest rated world's person. Dan thought they all belonged in tier three. I was like, I can't, we have to pay some attention to the games, right? And I mean, look, man, I'm not saying Connor is not good at TFT, but like his worlds qualify happened on like the worst regionals patch in history. He played a bunch of fucking multi-casters and he made regional, like it was, it was, it was a really fucking stupid batch and he happened to make worlds off of it. And so like, I'm not going to overly reward him for that. Um, okay. Right? I agree. So, I agree. So, yeah. So I think it's very clear. Look, I think clear is borderline. I think you could make the argument either way. He's the only two-time regionals appearance player who hasn't yeah. made it beyond here. But I will say something. Did he even show up for set eight regionals? Because I'm pretty sure this guy Wait, went question. eight, 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 eight. And then because yep. regionals had to be delayed due to tech issues, he survived to day two. He's the only player in history to ever average an 8.0 and make it to day two. Because Very he impressive. played a day two. But here's the kicker. He actually didn't even finish last. He, he said, I cannot go out 
on uh, <laughs> exactly. a loss. I have to. So he actually played for a first and he got it and he avoided oh, nice. last place. He got second to last place behind Broccoli of all people. <laughs> uh... yeah, broccoli's got him, man. <laughs> All right, so that's our uh, that's our that's our forty to fifty right now, uh, and we do have tier three coming up. But t- before we went to tier three, we actually yeah. realized there was a gap between forty and or between tier four and tier three that needed to be filled. So Bryce, take it away. An anomaly, a, a, a glitch in the matrix, whatever you want to think about him. There's just no tier for this man's souls that makes <laughs> sense. So he gets his own fucking tier. Uh, look, he's tough, man, because this guy has invested, like, negative energy in TFT. Like, he almost, whenever he plays TFT, he's like, ah, I guess I'll play TFT. Um, but he's all he's had so many high moments, and he's clearly, like, a TFT savant on some level. Like, he does a lot of things really terribly because he doesn't really practice or think much about his TFT. But he also has moments where it's just, like, things are clicking for him that other people are, like, just would never have seen it. Yeah. He sees he sees yeah. the game at a deeper level in some ways, and he also performs immensely well in the non-official competitions. Uh, in yep. ladder-based competitions like Super Server, he's the best NA performer. He won Summit. He's uh, done well in EWC four v four, right? Even in Soji's Invitational. So, like, clearly, he has like all the results, but not for like the important ones. But he has made it to regionals before. Uh, sorry, I don't have a. I don't know why I have a world one on him. That's actually incorrect. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's predicting the future one but... regionals for souls is kind of yeah. criminal in my head he had made like a bunch of regionals yeah yeah exactly uh so that that uh is an incorrect stat we'll fix that uh if we do end up publishing them but w- but at the same time we're not entirely sure how he hangs with the people who did do well in the official competitive circuit so 3.5 feels appropriate, I think. Oh, so souls so one regional is because it's set six on man. It's not we're not counting the earlier regionals. Yeah, we're not we're not counting like set four, or five, or or even three. So, okay, uh, tier three. So we're gonna move souls a little bit to the side. Here is your tier three, and at the very bottom we have Basso skills, which is a little bit generous, honestly. We could probably put it. We, it was one of those borderline things we were kind of evaluating. Mm-hmm. Uh, alongside other people who have pretty good highs, but maybe not exactly some of the results. There's a little bit asterisk. So for Birdosaurus, for example, he kind of has the new vowel problem, except Bird actually competed into set seven and actually has some pretty... He had a really good set seven, actually, up until regionals, but he hasn't really done anything since. And Bird has since been like a casual player. Darth Noob had a great set nine, but his overall stats are actually kind of kind of kind of bad if you look at it. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where like I think a lot of people know Darth is good, but then like you look yeah. at it, it's like ooh, it's kind of it's kind of hard. But also he needs to make more than one regionals. David is kind of on his way up. He's made a second regionals, and uh, right now I think just making two regionals is showing you that you are a little bit on the more consistent cut. Um, Appies and Ramblin, JD and Dpay, and then we're gonna stop hit the conversation here at Kiyun. Because uh, then we start entering a different group of players. Uh, so, Bryce, just talk to me about some of your favorites here from this pack. Oh, I have a lot of favorites. I mean, there's a lot of kind of the promise that never was in different ways on this list. I mean, I like I think Bert Bosso is getting a, is getting an eye test nod here. We definitely definitely influence some amount of the ranking. I think Bert is one of those players that like if he ever had actually really invested in TFT, he would probably be a top ten player. I think he's that good. So I'm really sad that we never really got to see that pan out. And then Ramblin and Appies, I actually think, wind up ultimately, like, bucketing kind of similarly for me, which is that I think that the game has taken a fairly significant shift in in play of, in the feeling of playing it since in set six, so set seven and on. And I think that it just, it's, Appies and Ramblin are two people that are much better when they're really enjoying, like, what TFT is testing for. And I don't think they've ever, felt, it, I've never felt like either of them have gotten all the way back in in the way that they were in set six and a little bit earlier as well. Um, but I mean, look, there's a lot of great players on this list. I miss Goose. I loved watching Goose early. I messed up. Uh, people are pointing out that Juke. I I, I have the stat. It's supposed to be Juke has the games and the average placement and the win percentage shifted over oh, one. Shifted over it one. Should be four point two yeah. average, fifty six percent top four. Okay, rate. chat. Dan built this entire fucking thing on like no sleep <laughs> like he has, he has like a brand new baby let's give him a fucking break <laughs> my bad my no i think they're having fun no no also no no uh, i know i, I know i know thing. i know i'll I say one thing the only reason why we have some of these na stats is because pro tft went down 
And it's a travesty that ProTP, yes. the website, went down because we can't actually look at stats because this is incomplete. As you can see, it's a lot of like, like we ha we surely have data on people like like uh, like David and weird. We should have that. But uh, Pro TFT is now down. So uh, if there's any party that wants to invest in the TFT space and you just want to throw money at the problem because, yes, you know, you don't want to make money, please revive Pro TFT because it's like we just can't track stats anymore and asking Gangly to do it for spreadsheets when he's also doing it part time. You know what we should do? The whole community should build a fund and like on the side, like Sims basically does some version of this, right? Sims and Gangly. I don't know exactly how it works. I contribute some money into like a fund that basically paid them for their time to keep that up to date. Yeah, yeah. I I would, but Brad, yeah, I think I think I'm I'm at my bandwidth maximum. I don't think I could. Yeah, you're doing, <laughs> I can't you're take doing any like, more projects. like one, two, four, five projects too. Yeah, many. yeah. Um, but uh, coming back to what you were saying, though, uh, I do like the comments about Ramblin and Appies. Uh, I'm really pleasant. I I'm happy about some of the people who are on their come up as well, right? So I would mm -hmm. say the big come up for Tier 4 on the previous page was Cam. Cam Buley, I think he's really hitting his stride as a player now yep. and really improving. Um, I think JD is on his way up in this as well, and David Ace. I think those are two players who are showing ladder consistency. And while they're not striking fear in like the milks and the disops of the world, compared to some of the other players, I think that they know them and they know that they can do it uh, if they're they're riding the hot hand. I think uh, T Lides is another like stock rising for me. I think that this set format kind of fucked with him a little bit in the way it fucked with a lot of people, yeah. like in terms of the investment in time and stuff. But I think uh, I, I if some of that gets changed and he's able to like compete consistent like he did in previous sets, I get the impression that he's ready to make the jump to the next level. So let's talk a little bit about that of like some of a lot of these world's runs feel like they stopped at tier three as opposed to putting them in like the tier two. And that's because we need to see a little bit more out of them because we know their peaks. Like Weird had a great set 10 or since Murphy County, as you might remember, uh, qualifying via like Riven reroll and Yone reroll and Heart Steel one tricking. He's very capable when he puts his mind to it, but you know where is he relative to the peak? He had a great set ten, but you know pretty much nothing outside of that. T Lights had a great set nine, and they had a great set seven. Juju had a fantastic set eight. Like these are regionals winners, mm -hmm. mid set winners. Goose had finally that deep run in set six. Um, Broccoli had a good Vegas event and also has been to regionals before as well, kind of having this yep. this pedigree of it. Um, we're, we're is probably too high now that I like really stop and think about it. Right. I feel like he belongs like more towards the middle of this tier. Um, okay. But... I mean, that's, that's fair. Uh, and, but, but and again, like, I think it's not a perfect side. This is no, it's definitely them. not. Yeah. It's definitely not. It's, it's, it's all directionally accurate is how I think about it. And, and yeah, no, I think this category of people is like, they've definitely had their moments, but, um, but still not like you know, moments of thinking you're, they're going to leap into, like, top 15 level. And some of these people were top 15 in their peaks. Actually, a lot of them were now that I think about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's also a lot of people yeah. with potential. So I think people know that Kiyun at his best is better than, like, the 30th. Yeah. But, like, the reality is this dude takes so many sets off. He plays... He's made one regionals. Yep. And that was, that was last set <laughs> where he almost made world. So, like, yeah, like... And if anything, if you go, if you would go off of like the the stats and sort of like the way we're judging it, he should be a lot lower than mm -hmm. other people here. But I think people like know that, and I think that's kind of almost at odds with like Bertosaurus. He's like the inverse of that. Uh, Bert, everyone everyone knows Bert at his potential is really big, so shouldn't he be higher as well? Maybe, maybe not. But the general range, I think, is correct here, in my opinion. Yeah, I think so too. I feel a lot more confident in like the tier work than we did in the specific moving around. I mean, for context, building this show was a lot, and we have another show tomorrow, <laughs> and it's regional. Yeah, this week, took like and four I, hours to do. <laughs> it took a lot, and I and like yeah. it's regionals week, so I, I've it interviewed all of the players in the last <laughs> in the last twenty four hours, and we're fucking like building the rankings for this week. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for sure. So yeah, so it's so I, I would say that there's very fair equivalent within the tiers. I think the tiers themselves though are pretty good. Okay. Okay. I'm going to take my time here, and we're going to reveal the bottom of Tier 2, Bryce. Well, let's okay. go ahead and move on here. At the bottom of Tier 2, and kind of going off the measure of peaks, uh, we have Toronto-Tokyo. Why do you think we drew the, the line here behind Toronto-Tokyo versus Weird it feels So some people might feel like arbitrary, given kind of like relative performance and stats. Honestly, there's probably some heavy amount of eye test that factored into us on that one. We both thought he was really good. I, I would guess that he belongs lower now that I'm like really looking at that deeply at the tiering. Like I think like because he doesn't have multiple regionals appearances, which is a huge separator for a bunch of the people in the tier three versus the tier two. Um, 
but he does look really good when you watch him play TFT. Okay, okay. Uh, we have Robovan, who made a very impressive amount of three regionals. He's the lowest of the three regionals players that we've included so far. And you have to admit that making regionals is hard because if it's so mm -hmm. easy, according to some of the top players, then everyone would be doing it. But the reality is making regionals is hard. So that's a shout out to Robovan. Ripple with a fantastic performance, but he's taking sets off. So I put him a little bit lower. I think yeah. there's a lot of disrespect for the players above them, though, in particular. The only person I think that gets his due respect is probably precedent. But these three players, uh, in general, are in their own right, have very impressive things, feathers to their cap. The first is Kyvix. This guy's stats are bananas. Uh, this guy might actually, like, if you're like, okay, well, these players are too low because the stats. This is Kyvix's adjusted AVP versus final weekend's players. In fact, he's the only player whose stats go up versus the final weekend. Everyone yeah. else has better stats if you include weekend one. Like if you include Milk's weekend one, if you include, um, you know, uh, Kurum's weekend one, if you include Robin's weekend one, everyone, or, you know, all these other people, their stats go up. But Kyvix is actually goes down if you include the first. So he actually gets better against better opponents. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, Replay is the other one who who I think has that stat trend. Um, and it's it says something about like the way they're they're just locking in more. Yeah, <laughs> they're yeah, just yeah. This they're just straight up playing better TFT. Yeah. I think is probably what's going on there. I mean, the the, the set that Kyvix when he won regionals, right? He won that one. Yeah. Wait. Yes, set he seven, did. Right. Set when seven, he region. set seven when he won regionals. He rated himself in my interviews like dead last going in the tournament. He was like, I'm terrible. I've done no prep, whatever. And then it turned out that he said a killer meta read. <laughs> and he just farmed the whole tournament off of it. He did. And I think um, I think every good player is really afraid of Kyvix too because they know he yeah. can play the meta lines, but then he'll just bust out something really random. Yeah. I think bag sizes ultimately hurt him a ton For sure. as a player. I think yeah. stylistically, it harms players like him the most who are just most interested in just like chasing random things. So mm -hmm. I, it doesn't surprise me that ev it, is it, I don't know if that's that's exactly why, but there is a coincidental correlation that Kyvix has stopped really playing in tournaments and really pursuing it since the bag size changes that happened. R regardless of whether or not it's just the bag size, and I definitely think that contributes. It's very clear that like certain styles of play that were really good in certain previous sets of TFT aren't rewarded in the same ways today. Yeah. And I think Kyvix is the way he yeah. approached it was definitely. And I think. That's I think when you're when we're talking about like rambling and appies and stuff, I think that's a lot of what we're talking about too. Mm -hmm. Um, so I pushed degree higher in this tier, largely because I think that in a different world, he actually won set ten worlds. Uh, he was very close to it. Mm -hmm. If you actually watch the games and why he had such a good beat, and his peak for that set, I think was in my opinion. Degree had a higher peak in set 10 than Rain did in set 7, but as you know, Rain's mm -hmm. not in this, so she's ranked higher. Um, but the, the thing holding him back is his regionals appearances, and that he started in set 7, so he hasn't, he's actually kind of a little bit behind a lot of other people. So uh, I, I wanted, uh, so I, maybe it's a little bit overrating recency bias, and we, we acknowledge that. We have a little bit more slanted towards set 10 and 11 and 9. Yep. Um, maybe that's too high, but I really believe in this guy when he really puts himself to it. Yeah, and I think that's like the first time he really put himself to it in that way. Because I remember watching his regionals play and thinking it was so-so. He had good moments and he had bad moments at regionals. Um, and so seeing how much his play grew and how well he played at that world was, yeah, I totally get why yeah. he felt compelled to bump up this list. I, I will say that you did, you, you just skipped over Spencer. And oh, I yeah, like, like most people do in their analysis. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I yeah. mean, people, through the whole set, rankings-wise, drafting-wise, there's not a lot of thought in um, going into Spencer in respect to his name, but Spencer coming, Spencer and Burt are, like, players from this era that you always, I always wished we had gotten to see them, like, invest and play more. Burt never came back, but Spencer did, and he's quietly quietly becoming like elite elite in north america he's one of the i always kind of keep a thought process of like who might be breaking into tier one spencer is the person that i am currently thinking the most about is he breaking into tier one okay uh not precedent not precedent. at number 16 not precedent okay. i i mean i'm not wow. saying that precedent Wait. isn't also in that conversation precedent definitely is in that conversation but i i, ha I think i have spencer above precedent in that in my head right now Interesting. I I have it the other way, but that's I, think, and I, I think I think, I think that there's an argument that that's like it, right? I'm trying to think who else belongs there. Interesting. I think Preston. I think Preston has the edge because I think he does have that drive and work ethic. Preston is very vocal how he cares about he things does. like quote Mickey Mouse Cubs and and Disneyland 
parking lots. Like, he actually cares about it. He's putting in the time. I don't know if you guys know, but President's also organizing the scrims that you're not seeing. Like, mm -hmm. okay, this entire past week and a half, you're like, where are all the streamers? No one's streaming their gameplay. It's because President's organizing the scrims. He's tracking their stats. He's, he's, he's coordinating all the players. And he's so he's putting in all the work to try and get himself ready for it. And I really, I really hope the fruits of his labor are rewarded. And people are saying, wait, how is precedent not tier one? I mean, it depends you'll on what you probably, why, you'll see why. But if you stack his resume up, it's, I, I don't even think it's close in yeah, that regard. It's not close. Right. Um, yeah. It's arguable. It's arguable as well, based off of some of the yeah. sets where he's had a low performance that we might be overrating precedent. Yeah, and there's definitely some eye tests going in on that. Yeah. Preston is cracked. Yeah, and it'll make more sense once we start revealing the top 15, which we're about to do. So let's go ahead and go from 11 to 15. So 15 is Asa, 14 is DQA, 13 is Pocky Gum, 12 is Rainplosion, and 11 is Goo Bums. So Asa at 15, part of it is um, that Asa is hyper consistent with regionals. Now we're starting to get to the territory where players are making regionals four times. Yeah. And that shows in Mescus. And the only time Asa hasn't made regionals was when he wasn't really, when he took the set off, effectively. So Asa is a very consistent player, and his stats look great, and he's always been there, and his peak was pretty damn good. He was in the running for set seven to be one of the top players there. He ended number three, I believe, in the overall standings. So I think it might shock some people to, to see that Asa's in 15 if you're like on the newer side of things. But if you look at his historical record, it's kind of hard to argue with it. It's really hard, especially if you broaden the stats look and, and think about his 4.0 AVP. I mean, like, if you stack him up against Pocky, Ace has more games played, better AVP, the same number, he has won more regionals. I, there's an argument that that should, that that should be just a straight-up swap. And I, I think that there's some amount that went into that of, like, the skill ceiling of Pocky, to me, has felt higher than the skill ceiling of Asa from what I've seen. But Asa is an incredibly good thoughtful and consistent tft player um I, like he his game is just very 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 solid okay and then let's talk about dqa young daniel the biggest enigma in the Man. top player echelons in general like this guy uh it, it, it's actually kind of impressive how his stats are looking despite minimizing tft like he's not maxing tft he's he's on the he's trying to Always put yeah. the least amount of effort possible so that he can be competitive. It's not like a disrespectful thing. He's, he likes TFT. He wants to compete in TFT. Mm -hmm. But it's one of several things that he's doing. And he wants to be at a proficient enough level to compete. Mm -hmm. And despite that, he's made it to a Worlds. He's still in there in the running. And he still sometimes makes that deep regional run. And he still performs in tournaments. Like, it's, it's, it's hard to argue. And then part of the X factor is like, man, this guy is the lowest multiple Worlds appearance mm -hmm. player in the top 50. So I, I really think about life in terms of like as a video game on some level with skill point allocation, you get a finite number of skill points and you get to put them in different things and you can reallocate them constantly. And I think DQA, if we did the like skill point allocation to success ratio, then DQA would be like rank one goat because this guy is putting basically no skill points in in TFT, but he's so good at TFT that it doesn't matter. He can still like make regionals and, and worlds and shit while like barely barely trying it's it's fucking crazy um yeah he, he he's th there's like a list of people that i wish we got to see invest more in tft and see how good they would be and we've talked about some of them like i think that list for me is probably peaked out by dqa and then like spencer uh makes that list for me ripple makes that list for me right like there's yeah, a there's a new few Bell. other people that's like i oh. i wish we yeah new bow like i wish we could see them like invest all of their skill points and see what happens yes yes uh and also an aspiration for other people right sometimes people say like do i have like there's, there's people who are even right now who are like maybe in the first years of their university or about to go to university or maybe go to grad school and say can i do tft and focus on school because there's a lot of like all or nothing, right? You have a lot of influencers in chat and on stream saying like, if you're not full-timing TFT, are you really trying, right? Can you even keep up with Setsuko and Disob and Weijin and all of them uh, if you're not like full-timing it? And the answer is like, kind of. Like DQA is actually modeling the way you can have your cake and eat it too in, in a lot of ways. So Well, yeah, happens. but you have to have like, your aptitude has to be off the charts. So yeah, it's like saying, it's like, kind of like saying, can, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like saying like, can you get a 1600 on the SATs without like studying or know what's going to be on the test? Like, yeah, probably some people can, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean yeah. it's the recommended path. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and uh, somewhat related to that is Pakigam too. Pakigam is the highest rated player who hasn't made it to Worlds. Uh, by the way, everyone above this has made Worlds. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Pakigam is the highest rated player, and I think that's accurate. Like, because maybe you could say, okay, maybe Pakigam's ahead of Rain or whatever, but like the 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 respect for this guy, he should have made Worlds. I, if anything, that that's your should yeah. be a one. Um, but the reality is Pakigam has a deep amount of reverence in North America, and it's for good reason. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's ever watched him play or talked to him about TFT knows that he is elite, elite. I think I've always said that he immediately goes into tier one tier for me when he's invested. He's just not invested that often. So I just try to stay in touch with him to know when he's actually thinking about the game for real, for real. And then when he is, I always rank him high. Right, right. Um, And you add the contrast between him and Ripple because I think Pakigam's peaks have been a little bit higher. Um, and he's been around for longer, so he kind of has more of them. Yeah, yeah. he's had more of yeah. them. And again, these are not factoring like cups. Like Pakam has done well in a lot of cups. Um, and so that if you're kind of wondering, like, okay, based off the stats, what about someone like you know another player who's made three regionals, so on and so forth? That's why we respect Pakigam so much. Uh, Rainplosion and Goobums, two rank one players from set six and seven, but they were a while ago. Uh, but I think the more controversial thing is like, why isn't Goobums like in the top 10, Bryce? I think a lot of people think Rainplosion Potion around this range makes sense, but what about Goobums? He, ha- his peak in set six for me is up there with the highest peaks we've ever seen, even though he did not win Worlds that set. Um, I think he was really, really, really good. But I think that he's literally only been in that form for that set. And he's had other sets where he's been pretty good and he's invested some of himself. But I just don't think, I think he's right. I mean, we put him 11th, so he's right there. But I just think when you stack his resume up against anyone who we have above him, I'd take that person's resume over his uh, in terms of longevity yep. over set six all the way through set 11. Yeah. Um, and I think that also applies to Rain. I think Rain is just like a a, mm-hmm. a smaller version of that. Her peak wasn't as high as Goobums, but it was pretty damn high. Uh, yeah. And she hasn't been as consistent in her regional appearances. Uh, you could argue, again, she could be a little bit lower, but I think just 11 to 15 makes sense mm-hmm. in terms of the bucketing from us. Yeah, she's okay. also done well every time she's been at regionals, right? Yeah, she has. Uh, should we talk about our top 10 now, our 6 six to 10 range? Let's go ahead and do it. Uh, it's already people debating about whether or not some of these players deserve to be here, but without further ado. And number 10, we have K3 Soju. He makes the top 10. Kuramex at nine, Robin Songs at eight, Milk at number seven, and Socks at number six. So let's first talk about bottom up. Soju in the top ten, Bryce. I think some people are saying, like, is he actually top ten? Give me the give me the pitch. Oh, I just look at the fucking resume, man. Like he's four regionals player. He's made it to a Worlds. His set peak that set was really, really high. He was incredibly good at that at at that Worlds. Like he could have been very competitive at Worlds. He did well. Um, so I, I mean, I I don't even think I, I think that the top ten is actually clear personally. I I think that this is like the ten, and then you can debate over what the ordering is of them. But I think this is the ten. The ten yeah. goats. If we're just doing set six through set 11 if you expand the time resonance a little bit different and and also some people like milk and socks and robin probably all move up i would say so as well um i think the thing about soju is that i think he's and i mean this lovingly but i think he's a clear 10 because the problem <laughs> is that he's not making regionals uh that consistently he missed this set he missed set eight uh he's clearly trolling yeah. some cups and so he doesn't have, like, th- there's an element of some of the people at the very top which says they just don't allow themselves to not try hard. Like, they're always putting their best foot yep. forward. And uh, so he just doesn't have that because, you know, I think he got a little bit accustomed to being able to turn it on. But I will say that we're starting to see flashes where even if Soju's turning it on, it's not as a walk in the park. He turns it on for a snapshot. He's not making it at 100% clip anymore. Before, every single time he did, if he wanted to climb, he would make snapshot. It's, it's happening like 80% now, 90%. There's a chance that he's missing. Well, so I mean, he's he is incredibly naturally talented. The game. That's why he's been really good competitively since the beginning. He was, you know, never just an influencer. He was always really competitive. But he probably works the least hard at his game of anybody on on this list. Awesome. And that, when I say that, I and when I say that. I want to be really clear. I'm talking about working on his game, like actually improving his fundamentals, like getting better at TFT. He will lock in and learn a patch in order to play that patch as well as he can for a specific tournament. But I don't think that he's doing any like bigger picture work on his game. I'm not sure that he ever has. I just think he's this fucking good. 
So if everyone is doing that, eventually it just it, you you can't fake it anymore, okay. right? You have to real you have to be in in top form, and you have to really know the patch. If he here's a hypothetical that's fun. If Soju actually did, let's say he sweat at the level of the top five plus, Ooh. where do you think his ceiling is? People love this question. So is he is he I mean, in the top five if he actually put himself to it? Try to actually. Okay, I think it depends a little bit on how open-minded he is to feedback about improving some of his, like, bigger picture parts of his play. But I do think that his horsepower, in other words, he can't just keep doing what he's doing. He would have to actually want to improve for real, not just use more hours, but, like, really want to work at his game. But I think his horsepower, yeah, I think he could be the best. Wow. Okay, high praise. Do you think so? I think he could. I think he could crack the top four. Uh... The top three is really, really, really competitive. It is for sure. It's really, really competitive. But it, but I feel like the top, but I feel like the top three of that is mostly the gap is work, right? And like a proven track record of like working Possibly. and staying in that form. Yeah, it is interesting to think about. But uh, I, I mean, I think that another way you can frame it is it's impressive his legacy relative to what he also has done outside of it. Soju is. Mm-hmm the face of North America TFT from the player's perspective, at least maybe you can argue like more dogs, like mm-hmm. face of that, but uh, uh, what he has taken in, in terms of put on his shoulders and also treated like tournaments and content. Um, yeah. His stats aren't like the best out of this top 10, but I think this is still a great legacy to be remembered as right now. Yeah. I mean, look, I think uh, I, I've, I have said that I think there's a three person Mount Rushmore for TFT esports i think more dog goes on it because he's more dog and then i think it's you and i think it's soju and i'm not sure anyone even has an argument in terms of impact be like at the same level that you guys do that the longevity that you have so to okay. do to be the most watched channel by far so do, when do people have to look at this guy's stream stats by the way they're fucking insane he's like a top 20 english streamer on all of twitch streaming just tft if you go to the tft category and you compare soju's viewership to like everyone else it's like he like gaps the next three or four combined or something like he's fucking insane at content and then also very very good at TFT when he wants to be. But I think uh, it's, it's enough glaze. I think he <laughs> he's blaming us in chat. Uh, let's move up to Kurum uh, and Robin. Those are two of the mainstays since like the beginning of competitive TFT. Kurum a little bit longer. He's been here since set one. Um, but Kurum had the great set nine. I mean, he won a cup. And then mm-hmm. went to Worlds, had a really good set nine. And in the past two sets, I think, like, I think if we were to rank this at set nine, Krim would be higher than this. And I think since then, he's kind of slid a little bit back, but you can't really disagree with his rest. Like, his, his, his tournament history is, is stellar, to say the least, even though he's only made three regionals. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure, clear, or sorry, for, for sure, Krim belongs in the top 10. I don't know. I really think it would be disrespectful to not put him there. I think that in comparison to the other people, like some of the old guard players that have been around as long as he has, he is the hungriest, it feels like to me, of that whole group. He still it feels like he still wants it so badly. It feels like yeah, he still is true. really pained by his losses when when things go poorly um for him. And he really does want to succeed and push himself. I, I I'm not sure that his that his ceiling as a player and I love Kerm and I root for him so hard but I'm not sure his ceiling as a player matches up to the ceiling of the of the tier 1A folks so I think that Kerm will he could keep playing and he will be competitive because he's very good at TFT and if he does if he like high rolls a little bit in the tournament he'll crush it but I think that he's giving edge to like the tr- the true top and I think he will be uh, that's at least my current do evaluation do you think the ceiling is forever cemented there can you raise your ceiling I think that it is hypothetically possible to raise your ceiling. I am not aware that for the way in which Kurum is approaching his improvement would give him the ability to do that. And in fairness to Kurum, I think that's true of almost everyone in TFD. Okay. I don't know if I agree with that, but I always think that TFT, you can you can find ways to improve. But I, th- I in my opinion, so my stance on it, I think it's just a philosophical difference. I think TFT is just who improves faster. So I think if you are able to figure out a rate of improvements increase, you can keep up with the very, very best. Uh, Interesting. Because the, the set effectively resets you. Um, yes, a lot of things keep carry over, but you get a new chance every set. And so if you can figure out ways to improve that, accelerate that learning cur- curve, yeah. I think that's a way you can catch up, even if your ceiling is lower. That's true. And the game, I mean, yeah, 
the, the question is how much more do you think that happens? Like how much more room is there for improvement of like core gameplay of TFT? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's go on. So Robin is interesting because this dude starts to crack the five mm-hmm. on the, uh, the, the, the regionals appearances. Uh, so talk to me about Robin. Uh, I mean, the mo- he's Mr. Consistent. It's so fitting that him and Karam, like their stories have been so similar. They both won Team Liquid for a long time. They've both been here for a long time. They've both been so consistent in their performance, but Robin just edges. I mean, five regionals is nuts. Every tournament he shows up in, he is, uh, he is uh, you know, expected to make the final day almost. And then how does he do on that day will kind of vary. Um, but yeah, he's Ro- Robin is just, he has been the most solid does what you expect him to do player since I can remember in TFT since even before set six. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think the problem with Robin is similar to Kurum. I think, I think his play styles, he mm-hmm. needs to innovate more. People are passing him by. In fact, a lot of people comment that Robin doesn't pass their eye test anymore in a lot of ways because he's like too flow charty. He's like yeah. picking up augment stats and just being like, it's gotta be this. These are my items. And he's just like kind of thinking a little bit too old fashioned in some of the his approach. But uh, he still puts up pretty good results, except we're just starting to see a little bit less consistency out of him the past couple sets. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that he, he he's another example of a player that doesn't really work at the underlying part of his game. He's yeah. he's also a big streamer. He streams a lot. He does a lot of content. This flowchart style was always kind of his bread and butter, but he made fewer mistakes before, mm-hmm. and he makes more mistakes now than he used to. And so, if you're not gonna find edge in the other parts of the game. His edge was basically minimizing damage and like playing, like make picking the right line and playing it really consistently and committing early. Yeah, um, a lot but, of people can do that yeah. now. So, like, what is he doing differently that's better? Yep. Is it just he has to high roll, and that that's the question he has to figure out? All right, now potentially some of the the harder people to discuss, which is Milk and Socks. These are players who are notably disconnected at times, and their resumes uh, are are different. And have peaks at different times. So, for example, Milk, he gets punished the most, actually, for us counting set six onwards because his peak yeah. is set five. But he's actually had really good results since still. Like, he actually was really good in set six, um, even though he was weaker than he was in set five. And he made back-to-back worlds. He was good in set seven. He was good at set nine. But, uh, you know, obviously, he's been taking a lot of breaks. So it hurts his legacy. Huh? Does Is Milk underrated at seven, in your opinion, Bryce? I mean, it's hard to say underrated because it just depends on... It literally is just, what are you looking at, guys? Like, we were more resume-oriented here, so I think when you just stack Milk's resume up against the top five, I think it's pretty clear that he belongs out of it. But also, if he, he, he basically didn't play two of these sets, and all the sets he played, he made regionals. If he just played those sets, obviously he would be in the top five. Like, no one... Like, you're going to find... It's going to be hard to find people who, will like, Glaze makes Milk ceiling as a player more than, like... Dan and I. I mean, he's just really he's maybe his practice insane. group. <laughs> yeah, his practice group. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. The biggest practice milk laser showed you. Everyone thinks milk is the best, except for me. Maybe, maybe Setsuko. Uh, you know that that's a uh, that's tough. That's fair. Uh, so then, why socks over milk? Uh, in my opinion, one of the things that was surprising was that socks was still making every regionals, and this set, I think, is really hard to un- understate how impressive or overstate how impressive what yeah. he did this set was. Given his full time job and all the kids that he, all the kids he has two kids, uh, and the fact that he got into qualifier points, yes, and he beat out Disoap and Setsuko and Pocky and Greya and Cam and everyone else that was behind him, and because because that's the hardest path to get to world. So the fact that we're cutting off right here, like he could go dead last in both these next tournaments, and maybe Milk goes one one right, he goes one at regionals, one at worlds, and all of a sudden Milk shoots back up, and this is all this, but but as of the time of this recording right now. That achievement is one of the most impressive that I have seen out of a TFT player in North American history. One of like it's a top five most impressive achievement. Yeah, I was like in shock. I mean, I spent I spent like multiple years hoping socks would come back, and then eventually I had, I basically gave up. I was like, it's too hard. I cannot get my hopes up every tournament when his like ladder performance is good. That like this is going to be the socks comeback. So to so when it started happening, this set I was like, I don't want to. I can't believe this is happening. Like I'm gonna just pretend like it's not. It was just fluke. But then he just kept doing it every single tournament. He was a beast, and he was the top in qualifier points for the whole fucking region. What a god! Yeah. 
bow to socks. And that, that's and the then, hardest. Right. And then he came on the podcast after, like, we're not on the podcast on the show stream right yeah. afterwards and was like kind of sad about it. And he was like <laughs> <laughs> talking about all the things he wished were even better. I mean, socks is just, uh, it, you know, if souls is a TFT savant, then socks is, I don't know, souls TFT. dad. Uh, TFT. Yeah. TFT. Yeah, I mean, this dude, this dude has like probably forgotten more about TFT than most of us ever knew. He he has like so much random insight that he's probably just never said out loud. Uh, he's just incredible, incredible, uh, and I'm so happy he's back. <laughs> I like this. Almost said Socks is aiming for seven kids so he can have scrims. <laughs> Set up his own lobby. I like it. <laughs> All right, so there you go. That is our top uh, ranking so far. But let's get to the top tier one. And I think there's a clear divide, and you'll, you, you guys will start to understand as soon as we start to list them out. So starting at number five, and this might already start to be controversial, but we're going to go ahead and reveal that number five is Malala. Uh, Malala here having won the big, the set 10 is the GOAT set. I don't think anyone's going to ever replace or be able to one-up Malala's set 10. But the fact is, he had a chance to play himself up into the even higher spots, but missing regionals and a consequent world spot this set, I think is a huge damper. I think he was in the contention for maybe even pushing beyond uh, just like top three. Maybe he was even top two or top one, depending on how this set was going. But Malad did not have a good set 11, and I think that was really crucial to follow up what happened last set. Yeah, I don't see how you leave him out of the top five. He's a world champion. He had the single greatest set of all time smack dab in the middle of this. I think for, and I, I honestly, doing in set 10 is also incredible because it was overall a pretty high skill expressive set. And overall, you know, it was a, it, a lot of the best performance performed well on the set for a region. So he did it uh, for a reason. So he did it like in a hard environment. So he has to be in the top five, but then also if you put his resume and like this, his AVP, his number of regionals, his number of world, like it just doesn't stack up. So he has to be a fifth. It was like almost the easiest decision we had to make in terms of the rankings based on our criteria. Yeah. I would say that also one thing that was really interesting was that uh, Malala had talked about that he felt nervous, like a lot like his tactician's trials, which is another big factor, by the way, if he faltered out through like a tactician's cup and was going against a like, higher, higher quality field, um, but listen, we're, we're hard. We were hard on players that are not listed here <laughs> for not doing well in the first weekend of a competition. We have to be fair here. Malala not advancing past the, the first two days of competition at tactician's trial. That is a big uh, dent on your resume. That's just the reality yeah. of it. Um, and also he said that he was burnt out because he's been competing so much and that's understandable. I think that's the first time Malala had experienced TFT burnout in the way because one thing that people don't talk about mm-hmm. is that if you make worlds, you have no off season because worlds happens, and then guess what? PB starts immediately afterwards. I think this was probably the first time Lala got ex- prolonged exposure to the grind fest of being a top, top elite, truly global elite player. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, he learned a lot. I think he learned a lot. Um, let's see what happens in set twelve. But I was really hoping for him because I felt like if Malala had made it, let's say he he made it to regionals, had a good regional performance, made it to worlds, had a good world performance again. This dude could take number one, potentially. Yeah, yeah, he's right there. But but a lot of this is about, hey, the best of the best have done it over the course of multiple sets. And we had that conversation, you know, about replay in the wake of in the wake of him coming on scene as well. And it's like the, sa- the same thing has to apply. Yeah. So it's, you know, yes, he gets up in the top five, and that's probably pushing it, if we're being honest, compared to the overall resumes. His peak is insane. I'd, I, I hope he comes back strong next set. Okay. All right, at number four is Weijin Iverson, his Fnatic teammate. Uh, This is a pretty decisive cut from us. I think uh, Mm -hmm. we figured that four and five were pretty set. Um, And Weijin specifically has had a really impressive amount of consistency. Uh, In another timeline, if if title wasn't going crazy in set nine worlds, Weijin probably would have won. It was between him, Wet Jungler, and title. And you can argue just like it's a coin flip on who wins. And if Weijin wins the world championship, you know, where does he enter that conversation? He probably moves up. Um, And I would say the the interesting thing about Weijin is that he's not having a a particularly impressive set 11. um, But yet you still look at like his overall stats. You still look at like his relative rookie season to his sophomore set to all the way now. And like this guy Mm -hmm. is still extremely impressive on his worst season, which is right now. And it is still, it's still a real, it's not, it's not actually as bad for his reputation as it might sound like because he's having a bad set. 
he's actually peaking at the right time. He had a great yep. Titans Cup number three where he had his flu game, right? He was actually feeling really bad. He got COVID on the day three of the cup and made final lobby anyways to start despite starting seven eight. And if he has a good regionals into worlds again, I mean, I feel like uh, at, at that point, there's no questions about whether or not he can even break to the top three and above finally. Yeah, I think he's I think he's in the tier one and the and for a lot of time he's been kind of set and forget towards the bottom of tier one and then Malala joined him. But he you're right. He hasn't it, it, it this set he's not impressed enough to have kind of pushed his way into the top three in in my opinion um but if he has a good regionals and worlds i mean look i mean the data on him is incredible and the eye test is incredible too he's just really fucking good at tft man he's really really good okay and for people saying swap these because i saw that in chat earlier and someone just says now you can't swap these man no way i mean Weijin has a has a 0.3 better avp he's made one more worlds one more regionals like i know malala set was insane but like the the longevity of this is really important Weijin yeah. has to be above malala and here. he's still based playing. on our criteria yeah one thing is we're, we're factoring in what's going on as of right now which is why socks is so high if socks didn't make it to qp socks probably falls out of the top 10 honestly because of uh, just his history is just like, yeah, not not actually being there. Uh, but the fact that Sox had already qualified for Worlds does factor in the same thing with this. We're factoring in the fact that Malala had a had a quite a poor set eleven by his standards. Um, because the reality is, and and I'm going to say it very straightforward, these people in the top four and above have no problem qualifying for regionals. It's for them. It's like they're going to be there. Uh, for Malala, the fact that we were had a question mark already starts to 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 put in a little bit of doubt. Is this a clear tier one cut after five? It is for us right now, but if he has another one of those sets and other people are proving their consistency, that continues to shake our faith, I think. Okay, so uh, number three. Uh, number three is pretty interesting. This might be controversial as well. I used to be really controversial. I used to be honestly. really controversial. Number three is this soap. This soap coming in at his six regional appearances is the most amount that we've seen. It's the maximum you can possibly have. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. This soap has made it to Worlds in set ten, and his stats are outrageous. But why is he number three, Bryce, and not uh, not num- not higher? I mean, it's just stacking him up against the other two. I almost feel like we should we should do the review on them because the whole conversation is going to have to be the relative value of them here, don't you think? Okay, so you just want to go three, two, one. I think so, and then we can talk about all three of them to, in one conversation, because I think that's very clearly the top three. Okay, so Dish Soap comes in at number three. At number two is Re-Replay. And at number one, there's only one player that could possibly be remaining. It is Setsuko. Uh, we, we put him as T0, and it goes a little bit for the, the headlines, but... Uh, I mean, there was once upon a time where Bryce actually did say that Setsuko's a tier unto himself. And I wonder if that's still the same way you feel about right now when you evaluate it. I mean, if you look at it, uh, <laughs> it, it he is noticeably a cut above in everything stats-wise. Yeah, he always makes regionals. Dish Soap and him are the two with the six, which is such such an impressive number. His stats, the 3.7, the fact that... Look at the overall stats, the, the like rundown, most, most cup wins, number one AVP. The fact that he tops out win rate and eighth place rate is fucking insane. That is that is so disgusting. Right. Because um, like Wake, yeah, for I mean, example, he's... had a pretty high eighth rate relative to the first, even though his win rate is so yeah. high. Totally. Um, and that's typical. Most players who take extra risk to go first go eighth more often. That makes good sense. The fact that he's able to take more risk and play for his first and somehow never goes eighth is just so insane. Yeah. Um, I do think... I, I So I think Dish Soap has to be three to like return to the original because... If you you can't obviously he has to go below Setsuko. I don't know what the argument is. It, you know, AVP Setsuko is also a ladder god. Setsuko, you know, the, their regionals and world stats are you know the same, very similar overall profiles. Um, and then replay has the world's win. So and and you know and, and the like, regional yeah, consistency. I just want to point out one thing that might be glossed over in the in the terms of all mm-hmm. the placements is yep. look at every regional finals. All or four. re-replay. Every single one, he's in the final lobby. He's in the conversation to make the world championship. And again, yes. making final lobbies is one of those things where, like, on any given day, he could have made three consecutive world championships. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that... Because I think there's an argument that replay could go above Setsuko. I I, I think that the stats Ooh. gap... I, I think the stats gap is too big. Um, and, you know, the two extra regionals, that matters. 
I do think if Replay doesn't have what was probably the largest kind of disappointing day in my TFT memory, right, where he is owns AVP and then he just goes 888 on the final day of regionals to, to miss Worlds, I think if he had not had that day, if he had just played normal that day and made Worlds, then there would be a really good argument, actually. Yeah, I think so. Because I think he would have done, done well at that World Championships. I think he was very good. I, I can see where you're coming from. I think it's uh it's it's a it's a sizzling thing. I just, now we're starting to enter the territory where like we're on to, to be, I, I I never when I was making this I never even entertained the idea of uh of someone dethroning Sezu. In my mind, he was clear tier zero. For sure, I get it. Uh, and the fact that so you're making a case for re replay to potentially be played. It depending on how you're framing it. You're not saying it is. You're saying there's an I, argument to be made. For what it's yeah. For what it's worth, my personal ballot would have I think. On this criteria, probably, yeah, I think probably Setsuko slightly maybe. But honestly, I, I think this is actually a very close decision. I think it's super hard to make the call. Well, if you it extend historically, much... it only be, is more in favor of Setsuko because he played in set five regional. Right. Was, and he was right. And replay took a big gap between set three and set eight. So. I mean, it just, it, listen, it depends on what you value the highest, right? Like, replay has had some some really low lows setsuko's had a lot more consistency two extra regionals there's an extra that replay didn't even play in fairness to replay some amount of this is he did not play set six right um and barely played set seven if memory serves right and those are the two that he missed yeah so he's made all of the regionals since he really started playing the game so that gets a little bit of point in his favor um and yeah his dad is not quite as good but he did win fucking worlds and his and he consistently shows up when it matters it's clear when he gets his mind up to play tft this guy can hang with anybody it's just that there, he he has more off days than setsuko does he does um and the latter is a really big deal for players i think that's partially why everyone puts this soap and setsuko as kind of a a 1a 1b especially in their current form mm -hmm. but uh just and it's not like Dizzle doesn't have anything impressive uh, outside of oh the world. He actually has a lot. Look, look at Dizzle was consistently doing well in a lot of high caliber tournaments. It's just that I think for us, it was a clear uh, Setsuko one, re replay two, Dizzle number three, which I think is <laughs> yeah. not exactly what people were expecting. I think in the end, actually, Dan and I were full agreement on all five of these decisions, and we all we thought there were gaps for all of them, just if you stack it all yeah. the way up. But this is just a, this is it just happens. It can all change stuff, this so, weekend. It can all was, change this weekend. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is it's like this is a snapshot of our fiftieth episode. Yeah. But like four of these people are still playing this set, and who knows what's going to happen at, at regionals and worlds? Exactly. And if you do the snapshot again in a month or for another set, right? A lot can change. It's so interesting if we replay goes one one at regionals and worlds, and Setsuko goes dead last, and like everyone else flames out like now we start to have real legs to what you just said Bryce which is fascinating yep. and that applies to everybody that applies for everyone so uh if you if you feel snubbed if you're one of these players in the top five and you feel snubbed here some uh some extra oh well, probably not Sasuga, but some extra motivation for you guys <laughs> uh, I don't think Sasuga could possibly snub when we put him at he's tier like zero. I'm should be tier negative <laughs> one I can't believe he's had this conversation I can't believe you even thought about picking one of these other guys over me we're going to show you some of the stats and the summaries, but uh, we're going to take a moment to look at some of the other highlights of the show for episodes 1 to 49 as Bryce and I uh, get ready to show you guys the ballots, the tournament stats, the fantasy draft history. Just number two from. Which one's tacticians come number two? Oh, yeah. What you're about to play. wins? What region wins? <laughs> oh, this tournament! <laughs> this tournament is not a quiz. I thought, <laughs> I thought. I thought. The, I thought the first question was asking what comp is the highest. Like I'm talking about tools right now. No, 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 no. You're predicting. <laughs> you're predicting for this. For this. <laughs> no, let, 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 let me. Let me. not do this. Let me change. Dude, it's not do this. Let me. Can I change that? Like I thought you're talking about like right now. So well. I agree. I, I think this patch. What, what happens is no matter what the problem is, it people just like fixate on it and then magnify it. We do a terrible job of coming up with like the actual relative comparison, like when Goobums will tell Mord that something is like the most groundbreaking bug in the history of TFT. It's like, come on, man. Like, it's not even in the top 25. Kiss my ass, right? And I feel like that happens about packs <laughs> too. Preston, how has your experience been with items? Uh, I, I think overall it's like it's been like better but like there's like this or there's like some aspects of like the item it's like the fact that you can get like five components post Krugs I, I don't know if that's this like falls under like like in like this category it doesn't but, but P, P God it's your forum buddy you got this. God, <laughs> God, I like this P God's like I don't really want to answer that question but I got a different beef don't yeah let's God. change the topic it, oh, yeah no, let's do, I, no, I, let's like, do this similar to, like, I, like, you should not have you should not be able to have, only have five components post Krugs agreed the thing is agreed 
So it's like you're playing down. Wait, also, also, wait, is two empty crowds a bug? Like, I know, we're like, way back, like, way. Yes. I think it shouldn't have. It I, I'm surprised. Twice. Like, I, I don't, I don't understand what is going on. How do they expect you to compete? I've seen that? Bug. It happened on stream twice. Like, like even in the in house, like, I don't even want to play anymore. Like, oh <laughs> my! Like, it, the thing is, it's Yoon was, Yoon was shaken, but yeah. not because of he was feeling like he was scared of acting. Honestly, if this game was balanced, I would be the who best wins player. best actor for that skit? Who wins best supporting actor? Like, with your one and two. The best acting has to go to Setsuko. Sure. I don't know. Non-acting non -acting. Non -acting doesn't count. Go no next. Best supporting actor. Honestly, it's probably Ken. I think Ken had the most line, or one of the most line, and he was always at the... I agree. Audio. I, I think we can discredit Bryce and Frodo uh, for this one. Just yeah, because they're the not... Like, Oscars, like, whatever, man. They're so, so bad, what? man. Right. So bad. Play the two other Kurums. Your Kurum X? Oh, oh, guess. Wait, guess, you guess? guess, 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 guess. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Cool. I want to hear what chat thinks, too, before we reveal it. Yeah, I'm going to guess... Baby, Kyun. Nah, it's me. Yeah. I was the second oh, one. Yeah, 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 it was it was Bebe and me. I mean, I think yeah. when Bebe stands up and does the wave, it's yeah. just so obviously Bebe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. His mannerisms. Up. Bebe also put on the morph suit backwards, so like his yeah. feet were pointing the wrong way. His <laughs> yeah. You could see the zipper on the front. Oh, that's a big yeah. Thing. yeah. And we were like, F it, we'd already been there for eight hours. It was the last yeah, thing. Yeah, right, right, right. <sighs> it is I, Bebe. It's basically like oh, TFT con. Oh, Even if you don't want to play in the tournament, you're going to want to be there. Because all your friends are going to be there. So it's just like yes. TFT con to meet all your friends and just have yes. a good time. Also, TFT people, a lot of them are like 25 or 30. So everyone has like money, I guess, to go to Vegas. And it's basically a TFT <laughs> con where everyone's going to be selfish each other and has fun. All right. So uh, those were some of our favorite moments. Uh, sorry for the rough cuts. I don't have the, the exact timing down, but... I figure we can go into some of our player report cards and start talking about uh, ballots and status history. Dude, I kind I kind of miss Bay Bay Bryce a little bit. So I, I like I feel like he's, he's perfect Bebe? end of season like like end of, end of the set off season content. Like the Bay Bay shenanigans at the end of each set is like so good. I, I I think we could use a little bit of that. Yeah, I liked it. <laughs> I liked it when it was just beefing with milk. I thought that was fun. I yeah. like in in general that was enjoyable. But then it just like slowly but surely went off the deep end and just became more and more painful. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So no, with the shark a little bit. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, either way, uh, wish Bebe best of luck in his new endeavor, whatever uh, he's doing right now. But I feel like it's important for us to kind of show our work. So one of the, th the yep. fun things, and this is by Sims. Thank you so much for what he's doing. Yes. Uh, we have a ballot summary of like how players were perceived in the ballots. Uh, and this is kind of going back to some people are saying, like, what do you mean, like, best uh, average ballot rank for Sasuko? Uh, this is what we talked about, which is he's always been kind of in this top echelon tier, uh, always being in like that mid threes or higher. Um, but like, Dissop has also had a high climb. You guys forgot, but Dissop was at one point. I kind of like 15th, barely making the list in set yep. six, and then had a rapid ascent to the top. For sure. Uh, really fast, before I dive into any of the specifics, I do want to say we have to give like a, a like this shout out that Sims deserves for this show is large. He did so much. Wait till you see all the stats that we have pulled. Um, but uh, it, it was he was just it gave us a lot of his time and attention to make this possible. And we really this like a lot of this would not be possible without him. So thank you so much, Sims. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. So at, at the list. Yeah. I'm not. I was not surprised to see Setsuko won. Honestly, Dish Soap getting up there just shows how consistently highly he's been ranked since he basically got on that level there's never really been any fluctuation with him everyone just said and forgot it the replay uh ranking i mean i, I we know that there, that he got disrespected for a while but it's it's fun to quantify it it's pretty crazy how low replay is has is ranked historically now there's definitely some amount of six and seven you just didn't get any rank right but yeah, but is this, that is that factored in? I that does, no, that doesn't. I was just gonna say that doesn't factor. So this is basically while he's been playing TFT, and remember, he made regionals every single one of these sets, final lobby, and he's and 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 he was rated eight point four two on average on the ballots. That's fucking insane. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, I think part of it was in set eight. So the the defense against this, right? I I agree with Bryce, but I'm gonna go ahead and counterpoint. Um, is that re-replay in set 8 was sort of an unknown commodity. He was starting to do well, so it's kind of hard to rank him in set 8. So that's that's fine. Like we put it, He was making lists barely in set 8. 
uh, as the set was progressing and going into the regionals. Going to regionals, I was actually biggest re replays fan. I, I was you telling were. Bryce and Destiny like, this guy is actually a special player. I know him. I, I have the Discord receipts to prove that, but um, uh, I, I remember saying that. So that's Wash. So in set nine, that nine is when that started happening, where it's like, where does he actually belong? Then set nine had the incident where he got weakened one. And so it was like a situation where we were wondering, or was it, sorry, it was set 10, was he getting weakened? Set 10. But uh, set 9 and 10 is when he started failing people's eye tests because at the beginning of each set, he would ha struggle on ladder or he would get weakened one. And I think that's what started instilling a lot of doubt and there's a lack of confidence. And remember that it's important that we are inviting a bunch of people. It's not just like, we're, we're not asking just Soju and Setsuko and them to, to, to vote. We're asking... Other people like the lab, we're asking Gangly, we're asking Natures. We had Inigo as part of the, the panel for a while, uh, me and Bryce. And there's a lot of other people. So it was just like the collective high ELO community was just sort of down on re-replay. And I think his latter performances wasn't giving them a reason to turn it around. Meanwhile, another set, another one-two from Dish of Setsuko or Weijin would jump to rank one as well, kind of put himself in that mix. I think that was the basis of why a lot of people were, low, were underrating him. So I think that's yeah. The, that's the counterpoint. I, I mean, look, any up and coming player is always gonna um, to like someone someone new to the scene, right? There's like a lot of history and knowledge of some of these other people, so there's gonna be a disadvantage just by being new, and people haven't invested time to really watch them yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then I I mean I think that uh, he's been somewhat antagonistic with members of the community, um, including me at times, and I think probably some amount of that, like he didn't like definitely impacted at the end of the day these ballots are incredibly subjective and it's impossible actually impossible to watch everyone and know their current form even if you have the time and have the inclination they're not the games aren't available to you um, and so people really just kind of rate off of perception some amount of kind of directional data for playing in their lobbies or whatever and then they rate the people they know um, and I think that probably there was some amount of the like lack if we let's put it this way replay wouldn't have been you know underrepresented if T lides had been on the ballot the whole time or whatever right like there's depending on who votes it influences perception of how good someone is yeah and I I also have heard on multiple occasions that people just close re replay stream after because they just think he's not taking the game seriously I can't like watch this uh if he didn't stream, I wonder if he'd just be higher in the ranks because he's trolling too much on ladder. He's just straight up just like uh, just messing around too much. Um, so, uh, th so based off the ballots, this is what it looks like. But if you actually look at the tournament stat summary, again, thank you to Sims. This is what it looks like, and it paints a completely different picture and hopefully give you guys context as to maybe why the justification for those stats that we talked about for uh, re-replay being what he scored high. It he outplays Setsuko in AVP or top four percentage just barely, even though mm -hmm. Setsuko has the edge in AVP. But it's still an impressive accomplishment nonetheless because Setsuko owns every other record besides gameplay. Yeah, I mean, Setsuko's nuts. Yeah. Um, Robin was like statistically performed lower, and Soju did as well, right? I mean, Sox has been the worst performer by far, but that's kind of like a, you know, IRL diffed number. That's why it's so cool that he's back. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to look at the the numbers over the course of the entirety of this period of time, uh, and just see how it all played out. Because it's actually a decent chunk of time. We're looking at, you know, a, a, Issa would say the the sample size is really small. I think we probably do undervalue the, how small sample sizes are when we're talking about these doing these types of big picture evaluation of players. But this is enough that I feel like we, especially if you watch the games, you could get a good relative sense of how everyone performed, and it all looks about right. And if you're looking at tournament stats, this has started to have an, uh, an argument that maybe Weijin is underrated at four. Who knows? Like, if you're just looking at raw stats, yep. should Weijin be even a little bit higher? Is he edging out Dish Soap? Weijin made back-to-back -back worlds. Dish Soap almost made back-to-back -back worlds. Part That's another thing, too, about Dish Soap being number three is that he had worlds in the palm of his hand. I'm pretty sure Dish Soap could have potentially locked up number two. If he oh, qualified yeah. via the QP, and that, but it's a different story. This weekend, now he's kind of playing for uh, the, the spot that should have been rightfully his. Totally. All right. Uh, with that, we also have some uh, fun things about fantasy, Bryce. Yes. Uh, so it's not just a report card on the players, but it's a report card on us. So first, do you want to do tournaments? or do let's, let's do tournaments. Let's do tournaments first. So... Uh, Sims decided to go back and just track more stats than just the players. He wanted me and Bryce to be 
kind of held accountable. So here's the first thing. Who's a better player between Frodan and Bryce? Oh, we're going there. According to the player tournament stats, and uh, I got cleared by Bryce. <laughs> Bryce actually just beats me in almost every category. Uh, uh, my top my top four rate is pretty embarrassing. Uh, I mean, look, I, like I played three. <laughs> I, I think I played uh, three tournaments weekend, weekend two twice, and I got fucking cleared both times. Oh, I mean, that's true. You played in harder lobbies. Uh, that definitely, days, it definitely yeah. hurts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, I would like to fucking, I, I would like to do this for real someday, for real. Yeah, Are you done yeah, playing, yeah. Dan? What do you like? Do you do you think you're gonna compete again? I mean, I compete this past weekend. I, yeah, I play yeah, but you do compete in the official circuit thing. Oh, that's hard because I'm a co-streamer now, so I would have right, to actually exactly. stop co-streaming for a weekend. Exactly. So do you think that's why That's why I'm asking? Like, You're do you more think likely to play than I am for a week. I'm not sure. I, I mean, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure at this point in time, the only way, the only way I could compete again is I would have to take a sabbatical okay. like, and, do it, and do it for real. Because right, I don't right. think that... Like the new qualification format, there's a lot. Like I, I would have to auto make weekend twos. I, I don't think I could. I don't think I could play a weekend one, weekend two, and do that for a whole set and not have my wife kill me, uh, at reasonably so. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, I mean, yeah. I, like I would love to try at some point uh, and oh, wow. actually find out find out what my skill ceiling is, but. Uh, Alas, and I love never. that we play the same amount of games too. How, how funny. coincidental is that? That's so. It's fun. really funny. Yeah, when I, I honestly didn't know what to expect when when he uh, put it together, but it's 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 yeah, it's very close. More dog Street says I can cover for you. All right, I mean, I, if there's one person I Please. might trust at the reins, uh, I, I may might let more. Yeah, I mean, if I have to pick anyone from chat, like that's that's got to be like the S <laughs> tier pick, right? Like it's like the rank one. Okay. And then uh, in return, a perhaps an even bigger question. Who cares about how good we are at the yeah. game? How about how good we are at predicting the game? The fantasy draft summary of Don't Talk If You Don't Know. And if you total it across the board, Frodan gets the edge over Bryce for a total of 19 drafts. Uh, but how are we measuring this exactly, Bryce? Why? Why am I, I mean, like this? Looks kind of close a little bit at first. Place. No, it's actually not close at all. You just destroyed me. I mean, it's it's you're basically think of it as like AVP. Your AVP was two point two, and my ah, AVP was okay, okay, my AVP. That's like a pretty big gap. You know, I went dead last, fourth out of four, all four drafts in set nine, <laughs> yeah. um, and it's the I only remember. set where I wasn't. I was trying to play. I was like trying to get better and compete a little bit. That's the set where I made the back to back weekend twos and the two cups that I played. And I was, I had no fucking idea who was, who was good at the time. Uh, aside from the people that I watched, like I knew I had I see, like I see. three set people. Nine, <laughs> set nine tanked your stats like crazy. If we even missed overall, set nine, I, mean, I wonder what happened. Even if you take set nine out, I'm pretty sure you're still ahead of me. I okay, am coming okay. back. <laughs> set 11 you are, you're doing going, well this set. You're doing well this set. It's going great. Yeah. I had a good last event, but uh, we'll see. Um, but uh, in the end, it's really fun. I just want to, we, we want to shout out some uh, highlight moments. Both me and Bryce have been outdrafted only twice. Yep. Uh, once was against Emily Wang and Box Box. They fucking actually cleared dominated. us for the set we night Knox fucking, Cup, which is funny because cleared. that was the best, that's the best cup that I did at. So yeah, yep. um, that's fun. And then the second one was when we got beat by Re Replay and T Lies during the set nine Hardsteel Cup. Hmm. That was the only time we ever got cleared by uh, by other people. But hey, I think it was pretty good. 19 drafts. We've only been like completely beat in two of them. Yeah, I Overall. think we're doing great. Yeah, all good. Here are some of our favorite moments from the fantasy draft, including one that you get to already talking about in chat. Check it out. I nominate Solus for one. No, no. No, 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 no. no. This video is so good. good. Two bucks. <laughs> all right, $2 for Kuro. Neither. What? 90? <laughs> <laughs> it's just memeing, man. He's just memeing the drown, but then he, uh, And then it's like, okay, you know what kind of strategy it is? It's where, like, if you get f***ed on, you just say, like, oh, I was memeing. And then, like, if oh, no, 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 no. And then, like, it's going to work out. It would be like, I'm a fucking beast. Like, like no, I fucking do. I just realized I have fifty-seven dollars for four players. <laughs> Yo, I'm so doing what? I'm down to, to sell myself back like f- this. <laughs> you can't do that. Man. You can't do that. Lord, Lord, I'll go uh, precedent. There's for, nothing uh, 20. quite like when launching with Soji. Right, I'll go twenty-five. I'll go thirty. Thirty-one. Dude, I always listen to what you. Yeah, no one out here. They're bidding each other up. <laughs> yeah, this precedent was actually like half of my draft strategy. Half your draft strategy, dude. You have five player slots. Oh, that's okay. Malala <laughs> or ten? Uh, <laughs> Should you not buy yourself? For not buying yourself for ten dollars, Malala? Okay, okay, I'll go eleven. 
Yeah, you... uh, I'm, I'm going tall. I'm going tall. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't, are you just trying to bully us into bidding less for you? Like, you should be worth a lot more than this. <laughs> Hey, I'll go 20, I'll go 20. I'm down to lock it in. Malala for 20. Wow. <laughs> Bryce bullied him into losing eight bucks. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't have... Don't worry, no, you're yeah, for sure. Like, no, he's going to pick milk. No, I'm not. Wait, Bryce, I'm actually not. 100% picking milk. There's no, there's no way you're not just... This is how he's draft? Like, there's yeah, no, snake format. Just, oh, God. I, I, milk is next on my personal tier list. He's picking milk. He's picking milk. He's picking milk. I'm picking milk. Oh, wait. Please! Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you. Hey, Soju, I will trade you milk for Setsuko right now. You can take it back. You can have milk on the Oh, trade offer! You want it, you can have it. That's fine. Okay, this no, is the okay. Only I'll trade ever, for actually. Milk. I, I thought you were gonna choose milk, so I chose Setsuko first. We traded Setsuko! I'm gonna put for yeah, by the way, milk does way better that regional. It was a bad trade. Uh, 15. <laughs> These guys are silent. Uh, oh, no, I have my eyes on other people. What? Wait, same. I think we're looking at the same people. This always happens. Dan and I bid against each other, and then you two bid against each other. <laughs> yeah. Every single time we've drafted exactly. together. So you said well, that's because that's you guys are terrible. I mean, you told you we fight for Robin, bro. Oh, oh my, my God. God. So, Ju, can we be honest about this? You and you and I have fantasy drafted against each other, I think, three or four <laughs> times. And every single time we talk about betting money, and every single time you get saved because Riot won't allow a cash <laughs> player in the event to bet. But I have bro. smoked you every time, bro. No, every you have not. Time. Dan just I tweeted, time, you just man. got <laughs> mocked. <laughs> yeah, by, not by you. Not by you. Okay, but you got like you got diffed by someone else. Like, what? <laughs> so, I got diffed in the fantasy draft where it was for a cup when I hadn't watched anyone play the set and I had not played the set. I had no f***ing idea what I was doing. Wait, did I get dumpstered in set 7 as well or no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you did. Yeah. Oh, you 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 know. overpaid for socks that one, didn't you? Yeah, you did. He was I the did. best player. I don't know what happened to him. Like okay. he, he, he got overpaid for socks. Yeah. yeah. All right. So those are some of our favorite members from fantasy. Uh, and that brings us to the last thing we want to do for this podcast, which is uh, just be thankful uh, and kind of glaze it up, if you will. So I'm about to yeah. show you guys on screen uh, a wheel. And this is officially the Wheel of Glaze. That's what W stands for in W Glaze. Uh, we're about to spin the wheel, and whoever it lands on, in true TFT fashion, we're going to randomize this. Uh, we're going to have me or Bryce glaze it up. Sounds good? Love it. All right, let's go ahead and start things off. And that's right, even random chatter is on the list. Oh, God, a random chatter. Do you want to go first? <laughs> Do I go first? I'll, 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 can I? I'll, I'll glaze a random chatter. Okay. Your wife, your wife is in chat. Okay. And she's been thanked a lot, but she's never been glazed on the show before. Sure, so sure, great, sure. great opportunity. I mean, look, for anyone who doesn't know, Taylor legitimately is Dan's better half. Uh, and she is wonderful. She's behind the scenes. Dan does not function without her, like literally and metaphorically. Um, so she is she is like the silent partner in in this like incredible suite of TFT content that Dan has empired. Uh, I've been there every step of the way and a sounding board on all of it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean we're we're lucky to have Ta We are very very lucky to have Taylor as well. Let me see if I can also uh, do a, a browser. Let's see, Nightbot giveaway here for a random glaze oh you're gonna go true random oh, i don't know shit. i don't know maybe maybe keyword is uh w glaze maybe maybe the random keyword w glaze who knows <laughs> i feel i feel like someone wants to wants to get randomly glazed up let's just make an app i love it this is a great idea all right we're gonna we're gonna close in about 10 seconds i do want to do want to give a thank you to my wife uh she's a really big supporter of it like even Things like the regionals broadcast or uh, the world's broadcast, those are like two crucial back-to-back -back weekends. It's just going to be really tough on my family, but I want to give a thank you to her. I want to give a thank you to my sister-in-law, Michelle, who's living with us, uh, my mother-in-law, Taylor's mother, who's also coming by every day to help out uh, Stacy. They're fantastic people. Um, I think we couldn't really make it without them. So if you guys are supportive of me, you're supportive. You, 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 you really should show a lot of love to them whenever you can. Okay, let's go ahead and roll it, shall we? Okay, Omar Elsher Benny. Omar, okay. Are you going to look user? up chat history? Like, what are we going to go off of here? I don't know. That's what I'm going to say. First of all, I'll say that uh, he sent 15 messages in chat. Okay. Is 15 messages in chat is, what's the double up tech for this patch? 
The <laughs> second message from February uh, 2015 was, is it so bad because headliners made the fact that just a forecast unit wouldn't give you the win rate you want early? Then he said, could there ever be stats for portals like most common boards played and won with it? He typed Spencer sure. twice for giveaways. How do you tailor the traits? Uh, he types yes. Blazer, 50, my God. Better call Saul. And how should it be positioned? Like far away from the enemy carrier. So first I'm going to say is uh, your desire to improve at the game is, admir- uh, is admirable. I love that you're engaged in chat and you're asking thoughtful questions. And also you've been watching for quite some time. And it seems, it seems like you engage with all kinds of content for me. So you watch my co-streams. You watch this podcast. You watch my daily streams. Uh, thank you for being part of this community because people like you, if it wasn't for for viewers like you, there wouldn't be like this podcast. We we made this podcast actually for people like you. You might be thinking we're making it for the players or just a yap, but the reality is when Bryce and I first set out this podcast, we want for people who are highly engaged in the community and you're a part of that. So you're equally as important to this contribution as, as me and Bryce and everyone else is. So thank you, man. Boom. How's that for W Glaze? You like that? That was beautiful. All right. Let's go ahead and spin the wheel. We're gonna we're gonna do it three times. We also have a reroll option if we want. Yeah. Oh, more dog. Oh, the TFT community. That's a good one. All right, Bryce, you want to go? Uh, yeah. I mean, look, TFT community is uh, legitimately special. It. I've been around a lot of esports communities. My job meant that I interacted with easily 20 different esports communities over the course of the last 10 years and tft is one of the least toxic friendliest welcoming most open-minded gaming communities that i've ever been a part of it is not without its issues we have certainly had issues over the course of our time together um but I think when considered like relativistically against other gaming communities or other internet communities in general, it's a really, it is a really, really special, warm, uh, wonderful place uh, that accepts people of a lot of different backgrounds and lets people contribute however they want to in whatever way they want. Um, and it's a, it's made up of the big influencers, but it's also of the people who are always in Twitch chat memeing. It's people like Sims that are putting together the spreadsheets or Kana that's like actually keeping a surprise of everything that's going on at all the different places and kind of being like the mom of the scene. Um, we're really lucky to have so many wonderful members of this community. Man, you're using up uh, our, t- there's a TFT community pillar one, man. <laughs> you're glazing oh, it up. <laughs> oh no, where are we a community pillar? We have to use some- someone else now. Uh, TFT community pillar. Okay, so I'm going to just follow it up with what Bryce just said as well, which is um, uh, I, I just told the two names that I want out of, out of, the, out of my hat, which is Kana and Sims. Uh, the first is that a lot of what these people do is thankless. How many times have we done a TFT tournament and we don't have a Sims score sheet? And we're just like, we're, like, like we're, we're living through that nightmare right now. Getting score updates in TFT tournaments apparently is the hardest thing right now about like following tournaments. We just can't track it. It's a miserable experience. But even outside of that, Sims trains other people who uh, aren't able to, who they do, they try their best, but um, he's trying to also duplicate himself. So please, if, you, if you're a volunteer in the site or a volunteer in the scene and you want to help out and contribute, maybe just talk to Sims and be like, can I help you? manage these sheets because he can't do it by himself it's all this kinds of setup but it's also more than that he helped us with this podcast with organizing stats and you guys saw all the crazy stats that we were like pulling and he went through he had like you know these models and graphs and line regression stuff was crazy he helped organize our fantasy drafts also sims also helped fund some of the stuff like when when ramblin's coming out for like the 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 stuff like he donated money to help contribute to that he Helped uh, pitch in for like our baby shower stuff. He's a he's an integral part of not just the community, but a lot of my success as a channel. So I want to thank you, Sims, for for doing that. I mean, you've been a big part of it. And then Kana as well. Kana also putting out a lot of uh, posts and community news. She's a modern bunch of chats. She's also doing a bunch of Discord servers. She's running TFT Hub. She's a retired mom. She's an incredibly successful woman. If you guys don't know, Kana is like she's like the the grim mom of the entire scene. She doesn't have to do TFT. She's just like she's just passionate yeah. about it. She's like in her fifties, uh, and she's following the scene. But she's also supporting a lot of people, both uh, financially and also with, uh, with with all of the volunteer stuff that she does, running the content team at TFT Hub. So thank you, 
these two individuals, you have been huge and the scene would not be the same without you, especially in North America. All right, uh, Bryce, we got only a couple more spins before this W Glaze segment ends. So who's it going to land on here? Okay, let's see what we got. Right, Dev, that isn't more dog. Okay, I promise to take this one, Bryce. Okay. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to, to two people. Okay. Uh, one is Giovanni Scarpati. He is, goes by the username Chimerix. He is a dev that I think most people don't know about. But if you follow a bunch of streams, maybe you've heard about him. He's the guy, he's the set lead of set 4 and 4.5. He's the set lead of set 6. He was an advisor on set 9 that did a bunch of champion designs like Belveth, uh, Cho Bitem, oh, cool. right? Uh, Talia, the house bound stuff, Rise, all the different variations of Rise and Set 9. If you remember, it was like a five cost based off portals. He did a bunch of work on Set 10. And I don't think it's a coincidence that's like these are some, these are four of the best sets we've ever had. So if you're talking about WKs or Riot Dev, like that isn't Mortog. Yeah, Mortog gets a lot of credit. He gets a lot, of, he also gets a lot of flame, but you know, we have Mortog on the wheel. Maybe we'll get to him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like, Giovanni, thank you so much for all you've done to help build some of the best moments in gaming that we've ever experienced because these are some of our favorite moments and i feel like we just i just need to set the record in case anyone needs to go back and be like who are some of the other devs that isn't more there was it giovanni is fantastic and and on that note as well kent being another big riot dev that also pulls weight Ken started off as just kind of like this sidekick of more dog for bounds patches but has since taken set leads and helped lead a very successful set nine and to all the future sets that he's going to do. Kent's been a really positive force uh, within Riot. And uh, Mordok has sung a lot of praises about the adaptability and the learning that Kent carries over and being willing to be molded. Um, and and you, can, you can see a lot of the profound stuff that Kent has done proactively uh, for the TFT community. So I just want to thank these two devs. I think you guys are great. Um, and I love that, uh, that we get an opportunity to praise someone besides Mordok because he gets a lot of praise. And I think we're going to spin this wheel again because I think Bryce wants us to get some more dog eventually. But hey, we only have one more choice left before we uh, we close the show. Oh, there's our, there's our chat and more dog left. Oh, right? our chat oh, and, and more TFT dog the, left. Oh, and TFT the game. And TFT the oh, game oh, and oh, our favorite sets. Our favorite sets. Okay. Our chat. Now, Bryce, we have the option of re-rolling this if you want. If you want to roll it again. I mean, I'm. I kind of wanted to glaze our chat for a second, actually, if that's okay. Sure. Um, uh, like the fast version of this is, we. T I talked a bunch of positive things about the TFT community. I think that this chat, in a lot of ways, is like an even more positive sub community within a community. Um, and we talked a little bit at the front of the podcast about our origin story with this with this podcast. And at the end of the day, it was really just conversations that Dan and I were having behind the scenes anyway. And at some point it was like, well, we could talk about this publicly. And it was like, yeah, but that's so fucking like in the weeds, esoteric. There are that many people that are going to be interested in this. And we kind of looked at each other and were like, that's, that is true. But the people who are, are our people. Um, so for the people who've been along for this journey, who like want to go super deep in the weeds of TFT, uh, who have made this experience so fun. Thank you. Seriously. I like the, I, my, the podcast is a mug, if not my very favorite things that we do. And part of it's because it's the time when you get to like actively interact with chat the whole time. It's fucking great. It's true. And uh, Bryce is reading chat religiously. In fact, it's, it's one of those things where a lot of people are coming onto the show to read chat as they're on the show. So I uh, appreciate you guys for being really active and memeing a lot. Whenever we bring up like a player, you know, like when Dishup comes on, the PV emos being spammed, the re plays on, or the, the topic is on them. They're spamming like his emotes. Uh, we have a recent inclusion into that. Whenever JD is mentioned, then JD fans are out strong. Dude, we have like 100 JD emotes in here. Yeah, I don't know how. Apparently my channel about, has just, been appropriate. By the way, all you have to do to summon them is say his name. JD now it's just immediately, you know, chat is going <laughs> to fill up. Okay, uh, bonus spin here. Because I think bonus there's, spin. there's bonus spins. Is it going to be more Dark or TFT the game? Oh, they're oh. both good. All right, wow. Bryce, more dog. Okay. Uh, clearly, this was rigged, uh, but that's fine. I'm good with it. We need to glaze more dog every once in a while because his job mostly involves him getting very overt, very in his face, 
largely extremely unjustified, often toxic as fuck, negative feedback about his game, about the uh, about his job performance, etc. Um, and so I just think it's important to set aside time to, to, to reflect on just how lucky we are. And and first of all, this game is amazing. We all fucking love TFT. It's the best strategy game ever created. And while Mort is very quick to give credit to everyone else on his team, as all good leaders do, uh, it's also, you know, Mort's baby. And we don't, there's no fucking war in which we get here or anything resembling here without him. Um, he is in, an incredibly thoughtful game designer that shares his thought process with us in real time all the time. Mm -hmm. His long-winded mm -hmm. Twitter threads, his the dev learnings articles they put together, they're actively trying to improve prove tft at all times they don't always get it right that's fine they're innovating the genre and the game at the same time and there's going to be misses sometimes those misses are going to be in design sometimes they're going to be balanced and there's going to be other stuff and that's all fine and that should all be part of our reasonable expectation of him and so i guess what i would say is he is not perfect he is a human but he is fucking fantastic at his job and he also goes crazy over the top to interact with this community in a way that is not part of his job and he doesn't get compensated for so I don't know he, what he's getting compensated in some way, Bryce. <laughs> he doesn't get he doesn't really materially get compensated. Let's just put it this way. The marginal increase to Mort Dog's compensation for all of the time he spends responding to people through his stream on Reddit, doing all the different community interaction stuff that he does is way not worth it financially. He's doing it for love of the game and for love of the community. Yep. And he's doing it in spite of the fact that he gets a lot of hate. So I guess my call to action would be if you're a streamer in this chat. Do a little bit better job of giving the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean you can't criticize him sometimes, but try to do it maybe a little bit less often and, and more thoughtfully if you can. If you're a chatter in the chat and you're doing it, shut the fuck up. If you're a chatter in the chat and you see other people doing it, maybe call them out. It's harder to be toxic in a community that makes it an unwelcome space for toxicity. So I'm totally down with anyone who wants to criticize Mort, and I do a healthy amount of that myself. And I'll probably do some of it tomorrow since we have another podcast episode. But yeah, for we're right gonna, now, it's going to be a, a pretty interesting 180 on that. It, it will be. But for right now, oh, the important man. thing is that we should oh. be treating Mort better because we do not fucking deserve him. Thank you, Mort, for everything. Yes, there you go. Well said, Bryce. Um, I'm just going to add a couple of things. One, uh, I owe, I talk about how I owe a lot of my channel success to people like Sims and Kana and, and, and all the people like, you know, Raptors in chat modding all the time, Taylor, Bryce, uh, Mort, like, relentlessly kept promoting my stream. He still does. Promotes my content. He created a, a viral YouTube short showing off my website, EFT Academy. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> great website, by the way. You guys should check it out. Best website ever at TFT. Uh, he's, he's a big reason why I'm succeeding. Um, I'm very lucky to have his support, but also he's just so generous. It's not just like me, but he also elevates other people's content. He's like tweeting out other people's videos, right? When Sejam met and reached rasters, he's tweeting out his videos. When other people are putting out great art, he's always posting about it. Um, that, the, the, the Twitter threads that Bryce brought up, that is game dev wisdom that is so priceless. I can't tell you because... Game devs in general, it's a cutthroat industry. It's hard to get mentorship in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. And it's also hard to get mentorship from a successful game dev as much as Mort is. So he's giving out these lessons for free, which is really impressive. For free? And I think that it's also another thing is that he's just giving back to the community by making tournaments. He's hosting PBE events. And he's also doing a bunch of like, you know, streams and Q&As and everything like that. Like, He's just he's just one of the most generous devs, I think. Just look at how many devs are antagonistic towards their audience in general. Like, if you just go and spend time in other games, you'll see what we're talking about. Uh, it, it, just go go and hang out with, like, Ubisoft and EA and Activision Blizzard. And, like, there's, there's good devs there. I'm not talking about, like, all of them are bad, but you'll understand what I'm talking about if you join other community for a while. Sometimes your nose is too close to it. You got to zoom out a little bit. Uh, just, I just, I just want to take that opportunity to recognize more dog as well for what he's done for me what he's done for us and what he's done for the game on top of what uh, Bryce has said so. okay and I think uh, I think that's what we're going to call it Bryce I think we can't glaze everything under the sun we gotta say something for the episode 11 special or 100 special um, but I think that's going to take it to the end of this episode so a couple of announcements the first as you guys know tomorrow is going to be our America's golden spatula preview with milk and precedent so many nice things, good vibes. 
lots of memories, but uh, we're going to probably turn on the gas a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, this current set, this current meta. And the reason why I warned that is because I think Milk already gave us the, the, the warning about like tomorrow he's ready to yap. So if you're ready to talk about set 11 and a little bit more about the present instead of the past, uh, tune in tomorrow, basically 24 hours from now. Uh, the Jets will be on with Bryce Milk precedent, and we're going to do the whole fantasy stream as well. And then, uh, as well as this weekend, it's going to relay into this weekend, the Golden America Spash. The Kurum is flying from Florida to Seattle. We're going to be doing it out of the Riot Studio in Seattle. I think this is a kind of the unofficial announcement. There's, I was yep. waiting. I was like, is there any marketing or like comms yep. around? They're like, nah, just like talk about it. I'm going to be, Riot uh, in, in, in Seattle has partnered with me to do a co-stream and this is the 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 studio striker that's been assisting in Valorant Masters. They've been assisting in LCS Finals. They're assisted in Vegas Open. So I'm going to be at the Riot Studio, and that's partially why I'm not going to be streaming Thursday. I'm going to be doing tech setup. Uh, but it'll be me, Bryce, and Karim holding it down. Bryce, you're going to be there for most of the weekend, I believe, right? All of Friday, all of Sunday, I'm working on childcare for some of Saturday. Okay, great. So we're going to have Bryce there as much as we can. Uh, we're going to also have guests on call, right? Like he said he's going to join us over call of the weekend. We're going to have T-Lige join. The usual crew has been doing such a good job. And then on the World Championship, the next weekend will be Goobums flying from Toronto, hanging out. Uh, Gooba, I mean, hopefully Bryce can make it. I know the time zone's bad, but Goobums will love to see you IRL. Yeah. Uh, it'd be really fun. And he did promise that Goobums would be on his best behavior. I know some people are worried about the Goobums, yeah. But it, trust me, he, when, he is, uh, when he is locked in, his analysis is fantastic. Maybe we'll, we'll Goobums is optimal at... 3 a.m. Maybe you yeah. need him to be a little <laughs> 3 tired. 3 a.m. Goobums. I could see this being peak Goobums. <laughs> Co-stream performance. Amazing. Amazing. Um, that's going to be it. Uh, you thought that was going to be the end of our W Glaze, but we have one final video to show you guys to play us out. After oh. this, I'm going to continue my stream to do China Regionals uh, group stage watch, but uh, any final words, Bryce, before we play us off here? Yeah, I do. So my final words are thank you to you because we talked about like origin TFT, but the reality is if you don't bring me into Twitch Rivals, maybe I never fall in love with it. And even if I do fall in love with the game, you brought me along on this journey of being a caster and a co-streamer and a podcast host. And I don't do any of this shit if you don't put in a lot of work and effort to make that possible for me uh i've really enjoyed every second of our journey so it would be silly to end our 50th <laughs> episode without some direct acknowledgement of that i love you man thank you for everything uh and oh, i man. really do i really do hope we're doing episode 100 at some point that Absolutely. would be really special to me if we could get there let's let's do it at least let's commit that far even if some for some reason that our our tracks deviate you gotta if something happens and you have to take sure. them off come back for it uh, and on that, I guess I, I can't I can't just take that <laughs> and not pass it back. Uh, Bryce is one of the busiest man in the entire industry, and he just he just hit double trouble. He hit twin terror. He got a pair of twins that are under a year old. That's six, like like seven months now or something like that. Um, so he has three kids under three, and they are crying and they are demanding. His wife is also a high powered executive, like working woman. So. There's just a lot on his plate. Bryce is an advisory to so many important organizations and people in the industry. Uh, and he, he does TFT out of his passion. It's, a, it's an amazing achievement that he's able to get challenger every set and stay locked into regionals. But he's just donating his time. His time is valuable. If, he, if, he, if, if Bryce were to send me an invoice, uh, I <laughs> would be bankrupt and ruined based on the per hour basis of free labor I have required from this man. And I would know because I'm using his, 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 his law firm to actually do some work for me right now. And I'm like, my God, I can't even afford Bryce. So uh, thank you, man. Uh, it, it is in, your contribution to seems invaluable. You're also generous. You buy people PCs. You send people free webcams. You've, uh, you, you, you've, set, you've made shirts for us. Hopefully we can get another DTI YDK merch drop. Um, and, and it's all from the bottom of your heart. You are down so much money being part of TFT. <laughs> I hope you can make it up one day because this has not been a financially lucrative endeavor for you at all. I don't think you've made anywhere close to the money back for your casting fees and things like that. Uh, yeah, I, and I don't want to, <laughs> um, but it has been infinite life value to be here. All right. Um, so thank you for the journey. Of course. Uh, with that, we're going to play our final video and then uh, I'll continue to stream after that. But thank you so much. If you missed any part of this episode, Check us out at DTIYDK on YouTube or uh, anchor.fm slash DTIYDK.
Bryce, talk about the ascent of Spicy Appies this set. So, okay, first of all, these scores, though. So he's such an insane player and a tournament player. The NAR Chemtech game that he, that he had that we cast, Dan will go down in history, is maybe my favorite TFT game that I've cast ever. I only wish we got to see his board earlier. What a wonderful human being. What a beacon of positivity in this community. He's always puts has a smile on his face. He's so supportive of everyone in his chat, of people on their journey of learning the game. He's such a great ambassador, and I just I just am so happy for him and his success. We have one final spot for rank one. And it is the coronation ceremony of Rain Plosion. She made an incredible run at Worlds. The last standing North American player had a legitimate shot at even winning it all. You improved a lot over the course of the set. Like, I, I know you're, like, joking about it, and it's fair. Like, yeah, set 7.5 isn't the same as all the other TFT, but I think that over the course of the set, it became clean, and then it became clean and innovative. You did some really clever positioning stuff at the end. You were constantly making correct reads on the meta. I mean, you were just... You understood what units were good and what made them good and how to put them together at a level that was above your peers this said you have some amazing peers they're all really good at this bryce got coaching from a few different play actually a lot of players in tft and he specifically pointed out goo bumps to the point where goo actually became a good friend of me and bryce going back into the beginnings of set four and bryce just said this guy has so much potential you have to watch him play. you have to talk to him and since then we've been really good friends bryce take it from here when you get coached by someone, you get into their brain. And what I saw, the way in which I saw your brain working in TFT was at a, it was at a deeper level. You were understanding positioning and unit interaction and fluidity between the trees. And I, I have had so much fun watching you get better and better this set. And I just am so happy for you. You were clearly the best player at regionals. I think you had a good damn shot of winning worlds if you had gotten a little bit luckier uh, in, in you know in the on the final day. And it's just, it's been a joy to watch. You're playing some of the best TFT that I've ever seen, period. Yeah, I think Ripple Order is super good. Um, he's the king of positioning. And I think going into regionals, him and uh, Degree had like a super good read on Hearthsteel AD. And like those two are like super good at playing the AD flex line, like pretty much like at the top of the field. If you, if you, if you look deeper, there's so much more to unpack about a player like what Ripple is doing. Uh, I think it's highlighted by maybe that moment at regionals where he did something like a last second reposition to get a Z wrap around a set on a center three by so cool. triple melee stacking so he can get that 50 50, which ended up being the reason why I was able to win a fight against a cracked 6 2 damage center three board. And what I will say for him is that he has every bit of the flash in him that like Pocky has and Socks has. But I think that his, the thoughtfulness to ripple stage two and stage three positioning is better than anyone I've ever seen. At number one, the most respectful, the most humble, the most calm, patient, and understanding TFT player in North America, Setsuko claims number one. In all of worlds, like, I can't say that there's, like, any player on the world stage where it's like, oh, like, I don't want this person in my lobby, but, like, Setsuko is, like, one of those people where it's, like, like, I actually, like, don't want him in my lobby. It is the reigning champion, Malala at number one. Incredible. Gangly was messaging our group being like, man, when was it when like Soju and you guys were, were like 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 being mad about things like the rankings? Actually, I think I'm able to pull it up. The very first time where Malala's name was even starting to be whispered, right? At one point, people were saying, who the f*** even is Malala, man? Like, who is this random guy? Soju was like, what? You, the, I, the, you, you put, why am I so low on the rankings? What? You put the Malala over me, right? Like, you got so mad. Now, all we have yeah. to say when people are like, TFT is a bad game, that it's not competitively viable, that it's... Because now, all I can do is just point to Milan and just say scoreboard check. Like, I think that's an incredible accomplishment. And you deserve a round of applause from everyone here in the chat and across the world one more time. For our reigning North American world champ, let's go. USA, baby. Let's go. All right, it's appreciation time. Dan is on a 45-episode win streak in Don't Talk If You Don't Know. He has never missed an episode before. 
you know, for those of you who aren't who aren't aware of kind of Dan's backstory, he was in a similar position in relation to Hearthstone much early. You know, he's much younger and was a huge part as broadcast talent. He's thinking so many moves ahead and he's just really kind of in the early to middle stages of his journey. And he's getting a break from this show for the first time in the history of the show. He's getting ready to have a kid. Uh, and I think we should all just say thank you to Dan for everything that he has done. When I was first started really pumping out content in TFT back at like set four, set five, I think the turning point for me where I really felt like I had a vote of confidence from inside the community was when Frodan responded to my DM about getting an interview with, with him and was like, hey man, this is awesome, let's just do it. And I do not think that I would have the confidence to start doing the broadcast stuff that I did in the last few sets if it weren't that vote of confidence from Frodan who, who said directly to me like, hey man, you should be trying harder to do this because I think you can do it. For anyone who, I mean, we all appreciate Dan. We all love love Dan, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't take the time to just say how much we do because our screen would not be what it is today without someone like Dan. We wouldn't have the characters and the the stories that we have in our scene without Dan. So yeah, 